Welcome to BBC News and our special coverage of the final journey of Yasser Arafat home to the Palestinian territories. I'm Doucette in Ramallah. Today is a day for Palestinians and the rest of the world to say goodbye to the 75-year-old Palestinian leader. A short military funeral was held in the Egyptian capital to allow dignitaries from around the world to pay their last respects. The body of Yasser Arafat is now being flown here to Ramallah for burial. Welcome to Ramallah. It is a truly historic day for Palestinians for the entire Middle East. But it's also a deeply emotional day. In the last few hours, the streets below me have filled with Palestinians coming into Ramallah from all directions, from across the West Bank, wanting to be here on this day to say goodbye to the only leader they have ever known. And now they're crowding in the streets below, many of them sitting on top of the walls, lining the compound where Yasser Arafat will be buried in a few hours' time. We expect his body to arrive here by helicopter shortly. It will lie in state for a few hours to allow Palestinians to file past to pay their last respects. And then he will be buried here in the compound, the Makata, where he lived and worked for the past three years, a virtual prisoner. The burial place was quickly prepared over the last 48 hours. Slabs of marble being laid down and inside the tomb, sand, special soil, brought from Jerusalem. It will be the culmination of Yasser Arafat's last journey home to the Middle East. And the day began in Cairo. Let's now have this report from Michael Voss on how the day began. Yasser Arafat's funeral began with a simple, short prayer service at a military mosque in Cairo. His coffin, draped in a Palestinian flag, was then placed upon a gun carriage in preparation for a military procession. Senior Palestinian figures greeted representatives from more than 40 countries who have come to Egypt to pay their last respects. Amongst them, many Arab heads of state, including Syria's President Assad. Most of Europe, though, was represented at foreign minister level, including Britain's Jack Straw, while America sent an assistant secretary of state. This was a state funeral for a leader without a state. Admire or revile him, the world could not ignore Yasser Arafat, nor forget the Palestinian cause. Security was tight, the Egyptian public were not allowed on the streets as the procession followed the gun carriage on its short journey to a military airport. Tears from his widow Suha and nine-year-old daughter Zawa as Yasser Arafat's coffin was taken aboard an Egyptian Air Force plane for the latest stage on his journey to be buried in the compound in Ramallah. Michael Voss, BBC News. And the day began with pomp and ceremony as Yasser Arafat was accorded full military honours. There, given homage to the Palestinian leader and a ceremony perhaps that he himself would have welcomed as Arab leaders, all of them, including those who saw him either as friend or foe, said their last goodbyes. A very proper, a very solemn and sombre ceremony. Here in Ramallah, we expect it will be very different. Just look at the crowds who have gathered here. They began hundreds converging on the compound last night. And in the last few minutes, they've opened the gates of the compound. I think, quite frankly, it would have been impossible to keep the crowds out. With every hour that has passed, the crowds have grown larger and the emotions have grown ever stronger. Palestinians gathering here to say goodbye to the man they called Abu Amar, his nom de guerre that he used in the decades-long struggle he waged to forge a Palestinian state. Palestinian security forces are doing their best to keep the crowds under control. But when the helicopter arrives here, not long from now, we expect it may be very difficult to prevent this outpouring of grief and emotion from turning unruly. This is the only day, the only hours the Palestinians have been given to pay their last respects to a man which has dominated Palestinian politics 
for all of their lives. And with me here, just on the edge of the compound, down in the streets, um, with the people that Yasser Arafat certainly would have welcomed on this day, is my colleague Barbara Plett. Barbara, the mood in the streets. Please, it's absolutely packed down here. I don't have the bird's eye view, but I would say thousands, if not tens of thousands of people are coming, and still more are coming. Everybody trying to find a perch so they can actually look into the compound and see the funeral ceremony when the helicopters bring Yasser Arafat's body. There is some word that they will allow people in to see him as he lies in state, but I don't quite see how that can be possible with this huge crowd in the short period of time I have uh, to bury him. In the meantime, I've been chatting with some people here, uh, Wadia and Saeed, about their memories of Yasser Arafat. Wadia, why don't you tell us your best memory of Yasser Arafat? Okay. The best memory for me, when that was uh, back in 1994, when he entered Jericho, and the Palestinian people, they carry him on his shoulder, and that was the best uh, image. And what I'm thinking, you know, the best image which I'd, I would like to see him, you know, with, that I hope he enter uh, Jerusalem and uh, let his dream come through and to pray in Al-Aqsa Mosque as Umar ibn al-Khattab he enter uh, Jerusalem. What about you Said? How do you remember Yasser Arafat? Uh, well we was hoping to see Arafat as a personal and we, I saw him when I'm uh, as American Palestinian, I'm a Palestinian American. I saw him in New York when he came to United uh, Nation and that that was that was the pleasure of the time at that time. And we hope uh, he could stay uh, uh, well, which is we can demand that, but he could stay until we see all Palestine is free. How will you remember him as an old man under siege in this compound? Well, uh, I, I, my age is 45 years. I had been uh, 30 years old uh, to be remember him. And do you think you'll be able to see him now? I hope so. With well, uh, that's that's why we came over here from about uh, 30 miles away, just to see his uh, his face or something to see him, to be in his in our mind. But as as you see now, uh, I hope we could see him. That's the only thing we can say. And how will you remember him as an old man under siege here in his building or from before? No, I I do remember him when he was in Jordan. That was back in 1969, especially in Al Karama battle. You know, when the Israeli army entered Al Karama, which is a small village in Jordan, Jericho, and the Palestinian fighter from Al Fatih group, they stand for them and they beat them. And that was the first time that the Israeli left their tanks and their soldiers behind them in the battle. Okay, thank you, Wadia and Saeed. I think we'll have to leave it there. You can probably hear the sound of the marching band just behind the compound, I think. Uh, oh no, sorry, it's actually a band coming along beside the compound here. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, anyway, uh, lots of uh, excitement down here. Whether or not people will actually get to see the funeral service is another question, but they're certainly uh, congregating here hoping to do so. Lise, back to you. Thank you, Barbara. Let's just take now a wider bird's eye view of that scene below where Barbara was just standing with the Palestinians. Yasser Arafat, they say, was always a man of symbols and all the symbols are now there inside the compound. In the last few minutes, uh, they rolled out a red carpet for the man, of course, who was their president, elected in 1996. And in that tomb that has just been hastily built in the last 48 hours, there is the soil of Jerusalem, the al quds sharif sacred Jerusalem, the place where Yasser Arafat would have liked to have been buried. And now there's a raw, as the crowds have grown stronger, the voices have grown louder, and you can hear the sounds of the Palestinian marching band playing the Palestinian national anthem, the anthem which was to have been for a, an eventual Palestinian state. Well, with me here, just on the edge of the compound, are some Palestinian observers of today's historic day. Riyad Malki, uh, just watching this, what an outpouring of emotion. It's a reflection of a uh, lot of, uh, uh, of many years, of memories, of expectations. I believe it's more of a celebration than really brief. I believe that people here, they want also to send a message to uh, President Arafat that they are also looking at his death 
as an opportunity for to uh, be born again as uh, Palestinian people, as Palestinian cause. And that's why we see more of a celebration rather than really brief. And uh, it is really a very important moment, I believe. Well, look at the thousands of people that are gathering behind us. What kind of people would want to be here today? Palestinians from all walks of life? Absolutely, yes. You know, we have to, to remember that uh, people from villages from outside of Ramallah were not able to come in because of Israeli roadblocks and constraints that prevented Palestinians from coming in. What we're seeing today here are people who are the core group of Fatah, you know, within uh, Ramallah city itself, in the refugee camps, but also people, the elite, people that are uh, university uh, students, many others who are coming here to show solidarity, support, and to reflect also what they feel inside their own heart towards, you know, the loss of their only leader that they have known. Riyad Malki, thank you very much, and thank you for being with us. So as we wait here with these tens of thousands of Palestinians who've now converged on Ramallah waiting for the body of Yasser Arafat to arrive. It, the first uh, plane which left Cairo a short time ago will land at the, in al Risha in the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt and then he will be flown by helicopter. We're expecting two helicopters to arrive here in the Palestinian compound just behind me. Today is a day as we saw from the very early hours of this morning where people are paying tribute not just to Yasser Yasser Arafat, the man, 75-year-old Palestinian leader, but also to the cause and the struggle he represented. So it's a day of reflection for all those people who worked with him over the past decades to try to achieve that peace. And we can go to Cairo now to join the United Nations Special Representative to the Middle East, Terry Edward Larson, who knows Yasser Arafat well. Terry Edward Larson, you were at the ceremony in Cairo. Your reflections today on the passing of Yasser Arafat. Yes, I've just participated uh, in the ceremonies here in Cairo. Uh, and I think that symbolized that whatever one thinks about Yasser Arafat, he is considered as a giant, not only amongst Palestinians, but also in the international community. However, a very controversial giant. And I think many people today in the international community are focusing on him as a symbol which did not pass away, but which will stay forever, a symbol of Palestinian identity, a symbol of Palestinian nationhood, and a symbol of Palestinian aspirations for creating uh, a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. And I think predominantly this was a show of support for that vision. However, Arafat has a contradictory legacy. On the one hand, he was a revolutionary who worked to realize his aspirations with a gun in his hand. On the other hand, he was also the peacemaker with an olive branch in his hand, the man who signed the Oslo Accords in 1993 and for many years pursued that path of non-violence in order to reach peace and reconciliation with his Israeli neighbors. Over the last few years, uh, again, Palestinians have raised their gun and that strategy over the last few years have been deeply controversial not only in the international community but also amongst Palestinians but today as I said I think most people are focusing on Arafat the symbol the man who actually created Palestinian identity and a Palestinian nation you spent many long hours, long nights uh, with Yasser Arafat over the past decade, starting, of course, with those secret negotiations for the Oslo Peace Accord. What will you remember most about Yasser Arafat as a person? I remember Arafat as a person, as a very courteous man in his personal relationships, as a very warm man. We had a bumpy relationship over the years. Um, through the peaks, for instance, when Arafat signed the letter recognizing uh, Israel as a state and its right to exist, um, a letter to then Prime Minister Abin and Foreign Minister Perez, that was in many ways the peak of our relationship. Uh, also, when he supported the roadmap and said that he would go for it without any qualifications, that restored a relationship which had had difficulties for some time when he created the post of Prime Minister and when he appointed first Abu Mazen and later Abu Allah. But we had a 
bumpy relationship and there were strains in our relationship particularly over the last year however we had a very conciliatory telephone conversation a few weeks ago not on politics but on personal relations which I'm very happy about today Terry Redarson, thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, from Cairo with your reflections on a man that you worked long and hard with uh, to uh, try to achieve uh, the goal of a Palestinian state living side by side at peace with Israel. It is a goal that all of the tens of thousands of Palestinians here would have welcomed. And yet today, even though that wish is not fulfilled, they've come to pay their last respects to a man they called Abu Amar. That was his known de guerre. And they consider him as a father. And so the Palestinian family gathers here today in Ramallah. I'm Lise Doucet. I and my colleagues across the Middle East will continue to bring you live coverage of this historic day. But for now, it's back to you in London. I'm Lucy Hawkins in London. We're looking at live shots of Ramallah, where thousands of mourners are gathering, waiting for the body of Yasser Arafat to arrive at the compound where he was held a virtual prisoner for the past uh, three years. He's due to arrive very shortly on a helicopter from Cairo, where the funeral took place this morning. He will be buried according to, to local tradition and custom at sunset. The Mokata compound where they're gathering is quite a symbol of resistance for the Palestinians. Yes, Arafat, of course, was there for more than two and a half years held a virtual prisoner by the Israelis. You can see thousands of people gathering there hoping to get a glimpse of the body and of the ceremony as Yasser Arafat is buried inside the compound in Ramallah. There we will leave it for the moment but of course BBC World will bring you continuing coverage of the burial of Yasser Arafat in Ramallah throughout the day. In Baghdad, insurgents and Iraqi government forces are reported to have clashed in the north of the city, in the mainly Sunni district of Haramiyama. There are no word on any casualties yet, though. On the western outskirts, local residents say American troops have been engaged in an outbreak of fighting in the district of Abu Ghraib. The Americans say they've also launched air attacks on what they call known concentrations of insurgents in the northern town of Mosul. It follows recent street fighting and attacks on police stations. We're going to return to our main story of the day, the funeral and the burial of the Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. You can see there Ramallah, where thousands of people are gathering outside the compound where Yasser Arafat spent the last two and a half years of his life. Gathering, waiting for his arrival in a helicopter from Cairo, where the funeral, the official military funeral, was held this morning. The helicopter is due to arrive at any time now. You can see people perched on every vantage point trying to get a look inside the compound so they can see proceedings once they get, get underway in Ramallah. A rather precarious position, the man perched there. Probably he has the best spot in Ramallah to look down into the compound to see what will happen later this afternoon. Yes, Arafat, of course, will be buried by sunset. And many of these people must be hoping that they will get a chance, perhaps, to file into the compound to pay their last respects. Well, Richard Myron, our correspondent in Jerusalem, joins me now. Richard, what's been the response to the death of Yes, Arafat in Israel? Well, the immediate response today is one of heightened security in and around Jerusalem. There are literally thousands of Israeli police and army who've been very worried that the occasion of prayers on the uh, Haram al-Sharif or the Temple Mount here in Jerusalem could spark large-scale disturbances, this being the last Friday of Ramadan, also obviously the, the burial of, of, of Yasser Arafat. And so what we're seeing here is very heightened measures, security measures in Jerusalem. Also in Israel generally there are concerns that, that this occasion could mark efforts by militant Palestinian groups to carry out attacks on Israel. 
Uh, but that's, that's exactly what's going on here at the moment. So there's a, quite a lot of tension in the air here in Jerusalem, generally in Israel. You're watching BBC World, live pictures from Ramallah, where tens of thousands of people, it looks like now, have gathered to wait for the arrival of the, the body of Yasser Arafat, being transported by helicopter from Cairo. The military funeral, of course, was held there this morning. Dozens of world leaders gathered in Cairo to pay their last respects. The body now on its way back to Ramallah, where people are waiting Patiently, it seems, there. There had been concerns of violence, but so far that hasn't eventuated. A very somber and sad day for Palestinians, a historic day, many are saying. I'm joined from uh, Jerusalem by our correspondent there, Richard Maron. Richard, you were just talking about the Israeli response, fears about security, but is there also a, a feeling that Yasser Arafat's death may have opened up the possibility of renewed dialogue with the Palestinians? Very much so. What we've been hearing from Israeli voices, and this is across the political spectrum, right and left, is exactly that sentiment that now, with Arafat's passing, Israeli politicians feel that there is an opportunity, possibly, to advance. And I, I say that word possibly very advisedly, because people also are very aware that other things could happen. There could be chaos. Uh, Palestinian militants who don't want to do business with Israel um, could get the upper hand. But I think there is a sense that Israel couldn't or didn't want to do business with with Yasser Arafat over the course of the last few years and now a newer leadership is emerging and Israel's waiting to see what kind of leadership does emerge. We know of course about Abu Mazen and Abu Alaa, the head, now head of the PLO and the Palestinian Prime Minister and they're also thinking about what comes after that, the relatively speaking younger generation who are emerging and there are various pig figures who've been written about and talked about in the last day or so with whom Israel is thinking that it can do business and maybe can sit around the negotiating table and, and come to some kind of final settlement ultimately with the Palestinians. But Richard, there's been this talk over the past few days from the Israelis that the first demand they would have of any new leader is to, to crack down on the militant groups. And that's been the challenge all along for Yasser Arafat. How, how much of a difficulty will that pose for the new Palestinian leadership? I think it poses a lot of difficulty because obviously they have to have the respect, they have to have the support of the Palestinian population. Um, various groups like Hamas are going to want to assert their power very much uh, in the wake of Yasser Arafat's death. And, and these figures, who I mentioned, Abu Mazen and Abu Allah, don't have that same level of support and respect that Yasser Arafat had. So there is going to be. Um, uh, they are going to be under a lot of pressure. At the same time, the Israelis are going to be leaning on them, as we've been hearing, and as you said, to crack down um, on what they term terrorism, on the militants, and do what they can uh, to end the violence. It, it's a challenge very much for this new Palestinian leadership. Israel says that that is their first demand for any new leadership, and certainly it's going to be weighing heavily, I think, on, on the shoulders of the new Palestinian leadership. Okay, Richard Maron in Jerusalem, thank you for, for bringing us that, that news from Israel. We're watching live pictures from Ramallah of people anxiously waiting now for the body of Yasser Arafat to arrive back home, back to his compound in Ramallah after the official funeral took place in Cairo this morning. Tens of thousands of people gathered in Ramallah waiting. Welcome back, back to BBC World News. I'm Lucy Hawkins. We have continuing coverage of the funeral and burial of the Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. These are live pictures from Ramallah, where tens of thousands of mourners have gathered to pay their last respects. We're getting news from Ramallah, although the scenes look peaceful there, that thousands of mourners actually broke into the Mokata compound there in the last half hour. Mr. Arafat is to be buried there later today, and it's thought that the protesters, the, the mourners rather, scaled the walls, broke through the gates of the compound, actually managed to get past Palestinian police who were trying to keep them back. A sign of the, the passion in Ramallah today. I'm joined by Mike Baldridge, our world affairs correspondent. Mike, do you think some Palestinians perhaps upset that more time has not been given to them to allow them to mourn? 
That may well be the case uh, during the morning, well before the uh, anticipated arrival of Yasser Arafat's coffin. We've seen the Palestinian security forces trying almost frenetically sometimes to keep control. They must have anticipated, I think, that people would want to get as close a look as possible at the proceedings that will unfold here over the coming hour or two. And of course, that's precisely what happened. Pe has happened. People have turned up in very large numbers, wanting to see things at first hand, not to be kept outside uh, the compound. But today is, of course, a about, if you like, an emotional charge for the Palestinian people. For today, at least, one assumes that controversies about Yasser Arafat as, as their leader left aside, as most Palestinians, I think, would, if at all possible, want to be at some place where they could uh, make some public demonstration of identifying uh, with him in the way that he had identified throughout his life with their cause. Indeed, in Gaza City, Palestinians have gathered to watch the funeral on large screens, so they're not being able, allowed to travel because of restrictions, closures by the Israeli army. Uh, that's right. Uh, certainly the, the Israelis, of course, let alone the considerations by the Palestinian security forces here, the Israelis are uh, very concerned uh, from their perspective that things should not get out of hand. There are always those travel restrictions uh, which are certainly being uh, imposed at this time. So for Palestinians uh, in the Gaza Strip, the reality is uh, their best chance of seeing uh, getting a best view of what is happening is on the large screens that have been erected. We are already seeing, we're expecting to see very large crowds there. The same is true also for Palestinians in refugee camps uh, around the rest of the Middle East. Um, also Lebanon, gathering, and in Lebanon in particular, we've been hearing that uh, over the last hour or two. Again, people gathering in quite large numbers um, to want, uh, if at all possible, to be together to witness these scenes rather than just to watch them in their individual homes. So of course, that will be the case for a lot of Palestinians in the region and around the world as well. You can see people there trying to scale a wall to get a, a better vantage point. We can indeed, and obviously one of the practical difficulties here is that uh, the security forces will want there to be space for the helicopter, helicopters, I think we're told, uh, to, land. to land, in particular the one bringing Yasser Arafat's coffin from the rather stiff and formal and brief uh, funeral ceremonial, as it turned out, um, in Cairo earlier this morning. But just getting reports in from one of the news agencies uh, there in Ramallah, Mike, that a wooden structure at the compound has actually collapsed under the weight of the mourners. Some people have been injured. Uh, we're waiting to hear more about that. But it's just an impossible. Look at the, the thousands of people that are there for, for the compound and the people protecting it to cope with that, that amount of mourners. Indeed. I mean, the, these, of course, were always just the type of risks that the, uh, the Palestinian authorities would have been concerned about. The, um, physical danger to people because of a, a, a crowding of this kind. That would be one of the reasons they would have wanted to keep the numbers under control in the compound. Also, of course, the, the risk of the, just the general volatility of the situation as, as well, though there's been no significant signs yet of anybody wanting to cause any trouble around these events. I think as much as anything else, it would be um, concerned just about the pressures of the crowds. And if, we're, if, if indeed there are reports of that starting to happen, that obviously will be a concern. Um, we do expect the uh, formalities to be over quite quickly once the coffin does arrive. Um, the requirement to uh, bury Yasser Arafat b before sunset as the day is marching on now um, in the area, that means inevitably it won't last too long. Perhaps that's on the side of the authorities, but, but just from the numbers gathering already, we, could, we can see the problem. And we have seen the diggers in there over the past few days hastily building a tomb beneath uh, the trees in his compound. He'll uh, be buried with soil from, um, from the compound of the Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, very important. From the Al-Aqsa Mosque, mm. that's right. I mean, of course, we know that Yasser Arafat w would have been wanted to, to be buried in Jerusalem itself. Uh, that has not been possible. The Israelis had, had ruled that out. Uh, and so uh, this is the next best thing, as, as Palestinians would see it, a temporary burial place for Yasser Arafat, uh, very much hoping that uh, his remains will be able to be taken to Jerusalem at some time in the future. But symbolically, um, the fact that his uh, encased uh, tomb will be sitting on soil that's been brought from the Al-Aqsa Mosque, just a few miles away, of course, is going to be a very important dimension of this. You can see some signs there, perhaps, of a few disturbances in Ramallah. We've got with us also Matthew Price, our correspondent who's been following events from Cairo. 
Matthew, it seemed to go very well this morning in Cairo. Was there any anger that there was no public service, though? Well, I think for the half million or so Palestinian refugees who live in Egypt, uh, they would have desperately liked to have seen at least Yasser Arafat's coffin as it was processed down one of the highways here um, from where the military funeral was held to the waiting aircraft at a nearby airbase. Uh, and, and a great number of Egyptians as well would have felt very much the same. Here is a man who for them has uh, epitomized the Palestinian struggle uh, for their entire lifetime, certainly for his entire lifetime. And people, I think, would, yes, have liked to have paid their last respects as a large number of international visitors were allowed to today. But the Egyptian authorities were absolutely adamant. They were not happy uh, with having uh, um, any sort of um, possibility of uh, uh either trouble or just a sheer volume of people um, crowding around a funeral cortege. Uh, possibly some of the sort of problems that uh, we, we may be seeing in Ramallah at the moment, the sheer emotion, the sheer weight of numbers of people just trying to get themselves to um, uh, witness Yasser Arafat's uh, coffin being brought, his body being brought back to Ramallah. Um, so I think in Cairo that's what they were trying to avoid and they managed to do it. Um, the, the, the funeral was a relatively short service, it passed off um, uh, very easily. Um, one senior uh, representative of the international community who was there did actually tell me a couple of moments ago that uh, at one point the Egyptian um, uh, security forces uh, shut tight the gates it, that led into the military compound in which the funeral was held and this prevented, uh, this senior representative of the international community told me, uh, prevented a number of uh, the international dignitaries actually getting in to the funeral of Yasser Arafat. Um, however, overall a large number of uh, Arab heads of state, a large number of international um, visitors, foreign ministers from the European Union were there uh, and uh, uh, various other international representatives. Crucial, it, it was the fact that um, the Palestinian leadership was there. And um, what was most interesting, I think, is that the former Prime Minister, not the current Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister, a man called Mahmoud Abbas, who many have tipped as the sort of overall head at the moment um, of the Palestinian leadership, he was the first Palestinian representative to be welcoming the international uh, delegates, the, the international arrivals. He was the first Palestinian to be shaking their hands. And I think that gives us an interesting insight at the moment as to uh, the way that the Palestinian leadership certainly for now is shaping up. Mahmoud Abbas, it appears certainly from the visual signals we've had here in Cairo this morning, um, very much uh, the man in charge at the moment, although obviously with other members of Yasser Arafat's old guard around him and having to work closely with uh, other members of the, the Palestinian political structure, men like Mahmoud uh, Dahlan, who is the uh, former security chief in the Gaza Strip, and also uh, Jibril Rajoub, who is the uh, security chief in the West Bank and Gaza. Matthew, some Arab states were criticized for not doing enough to help the Palestinians during this current intifada. Just how much influence do you think they'll be looking to have now with the new leadership? Well, certainly speaking to uh, e Egyptian sources here, I, I think there is a general concern in the Arab world, not in the immediate future, because um, let's face it, in the last couple of weeks during which Yasser Arafat has lain in his hospital bed in Paris, um, it, it has become clear that uh, there has been a lot of political manoeuvring behind the scenes, but in public, the Palestinian leadership has shown itself to be strong. It says it's following the constitutional rules which allow for the provision of elections within 60 days of the death of the president uh, of, of the Palestinian Authority, Yasser Arafat. And, um, and they say that they will be doing all they can to hold those elections. It's interesting to note about a month ago when um, there, were, well, there was talk of holding municipal, possibly wider scale elections, maybe even presidential elections. Um, when I last spoke to the Palestinian Election Commission, they told me that they, they now had uh, about two thirds of eligible Palestinians registered to vote and that they were in a position to hold elections. Now this came uh, a, a few weeks before uh, Yasser Arafat's illness and now his subsequent death. But uh, the Palestinian Election Commission is pretty certain that it can carry out elections and it can hold them. Uh, and it needs to do that constitutionally, at least, within the next 60 days. So the, the feeling, the sense I'm getting, certainly from Egyptian officials, is that those processes are being followed. There is a leadership in place. There 
are politicians at the moment continuing to work um, uh, in the West Bank and Gaza um, uh, and trying to run the West Bank and Gaza and managing to do so as they have now for the last few years. Obviously they always stress that it's very difficult under Israeli occupation. So the Egyptian officials I'm talking to are saying that that is not their immediate worry. That their worry is more a medium to long term one. What happens if the various groups within the Palestinian political uh, machine start to vie for position? You have Yasser Arafat's old guard on the one hand, the men that he surrounded himself with, the men that he prevented becoming particularly strong. You then have the new guard, men who grew up in Gaza and the West Bank, men who I've mentioned like Mahmoud, uh, um, uh, like uh, Mohammed Dalan and uh, Jibril Rajoub, um, security chiefs in Gaza and the West Bank. You have those people who have to be brought into the equation. And you also then, of course, have groups like Hamas, uh, the Islamic militant group, um, with its uh, campaign, uh, its militant campaign, uh, often against Israeli citizens. You have other groups like Islamic Jihad, um, uh, offshoots of Yasser Arafat's Fatah organization, the Al-Aqsa Brigades. What will these groups decide to do? What will be their choice now? Will they decide to vie for power? Will they decide to try and take over? And if they do, then in the wider Arab world, I think there is a fear of chaos. There is a fear of chaos within the Palestinian territories, and if that happens, there is a fear of that chaos spreading from the Palestinian territories across the borders, not just into Israel, but into other Arab states. Matthew, given how much support Islamic Jihad and Hamas and other militant groups has, how much support does the Palestinian political establishment have now as it sort of struggles to elect a new leader? Well, I was talking about Mahmoud Abbas, the former Prime Minister, and uh, the man who, as I said, at, at this funeral was the first to be shaking hands um, here in Cairo with international leaders. It very much appears that he is, if not the top of the tree, right there, along with Ahmed Karea, the, uh, the, the, the current Prime Minister. But it appears Mahmoud Abbas and Ahmed Karea are very important players at the moment. The big problem is, they are, of course, respected internationally. They've both been involved in peace negotiations. They were involved in the Oslo peace process in the early 90s and mid 90s. But the big problem is they do not have the support of the Palestinian street. They are not widely respected on that street. And the, the key question that people have been asking in the last few weeks of Yasser Arafat's illness and now that he has died, the key question people are saying is, look, who does command such respect? And when you ask analysts, they say, well, there isn't anybody. So therefore, a new unified leadership has to emerge. So this is why this question of what the various factions within Palestinian political society, what they are going to do, this is why this is so important right now. Not perhaps so much on this particular day, the day of what we suspect to be Yasser Arafat's burial, that's certainly what planned, although if the rather chaotic scenes in Ramallah at the moment are anything to go by, um, those plans may well at least have to be delayed if not put on hold for today, I would suspect, um, because having stood outside Yasser Arafat's compounds when the two Jordanian helicopters took off a fortnight ago and watched the preparations and the meticulous safety that was carried out there, there were fire engines in the compound, there were um, all sorts of safety arrangements, ambulances brought in, and that compound was cleared for the most part of um, people. Yes, Arafat's staff were there, but the public was certainly not allowed in. Now, those scenes that we're seeing at the moment, and you're seeing on the television screens at the moment, of various different groups, different political groups in the Palestinian machine coming down to Yasser Arafat's compound. Um, storming, we've heard, some of them, uh, it, it, it appears that perhaps they forced their way into the compound. This is going to make it very difficult for today's events to continue. And these are the sort of chaotic scenes which uh, Yasser Arafat's um, uh, uh, successors, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, Ahmed Karea, Saab Erekat, the other names that you've heard so much of in the last couple of weeks and, and seen so much of on the television screens. These are the scenes that uh, the Palestinian, the new Palestinian leadership could have done without, I think, because uh, for a start, it makes it very difficult to continue this um, uh, today, the, the, the burial of Yasser Arafat, which is meant to take place in the exact location that you're now seeing your television pictures. But at the same time, I think there will be a feeling in some Palestinian circles that this sends out the wrong impression, the wrong picture to the, the world. Uh, these pictures are now being beamed around the world. They are scenes clearly of a great deal of emotion in Ramallah at the moment and a great deal of grief. I don't think we're seeing any scenes of violence and, and certainly nothing su to suggest that this situation is out of control. But this sheer weight of numbers demonstrates very vividly, I think, very vividly indeed, 
the number of different groups within Palestinian society who in the coming months will all start vying for power. And that is the great fear, that if the leadership as it exists at the moment can't hold this together, then there could potentially be problems in the, long, in the medium to long term. Matthew Price and Cairo, thank you. We can join now our correspondent in Ramallah, Barbara Plett. Barbara, we seem to be seeing pictures of the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade par par parading through the streets. Tell us what you're witnessing. Well, I'm watching attempts at crowd control, actually. There's a lot of people, as Matthew was saying, who've made their way into the compound. They started coming in over the top of the buildings at the back. They found the weak spots and started coming in through the back, and then eventually, under the pressure of the crowd, it seems they've opened the gate, but they're still streaming into the compound, coming closer and closer, both, actually, I think they've surrounded the burial plot now. Uh, there's a, a whole bunch of uh, security guards standing on the burial plot. Uh, and they're coming closer and closer to the two points where we expect the helicopters to land. In front of them is a vanguard uh, of security men, if you will, but they seem to be being uh, slowly pushed forward more than anything else. Uh, it's a bit hard to see exactly what they're going to be able to do to control this crowd when the helicopter lands. As you were saying, we did see some, uh, some uh, young men dressed in black with masks on, uh, brandishing swords, just walking down the uh, walking down the street a little while ago. I think they did go into the compound. That's probably more of a media show than anything. Uh, but we've got everybody out here. We've also got a Christian delegation. There's a, a very senior Christian religious uh, figure here, a bishop, I think. And also uh, what we were seeing before were uh, apparently uh, monks or friars maybe probably come from Jerusalem. Yes, Arafat has always made a very made it a, a real a stress that he is the leader not only of the Muslims but of the Christians. Uh, he was very keen to point that out and he uh, and he had quite good relations with the Christians. Right now we've got, um, it looks like a Boy Scout type band coming up. I don't know if you can hear that, hear that sound. They're banging drums and carrying a Palestinian flag uh, on their way uh, down the street into the compound. Barbara, is the helicopter actually going to be able to land at the moment, from what you can see? Well, there is still quite a bit of space around the landing spots. I don't know how much space they actually need, but presumably when the helicopters come, the crowd will push back uh, a little bit. Um, like I said, they have been able to keep that area clear. What's probably a bit more problematic is that they haven't been able to keep the area around the burial park clear. It's completely surrounded by people now, uh, and the security is obviously uh, preparing for some kind of surge because they've taken up positions on the gravesite. Barbara, we've also had reports here of a wooden structure collapsing under the weight of a throng of mourners. Can you see that, no, or have you heard? No, I, I haven't seen that, but I have to say a lot of the perches that the mourners have taken look rather precarious to me, beginning with the young man that I can see right in front of me sitting on near the top of an electricity pylon. Uh, you've probably seen the pictures also of people um, right along the edge, uh, sitting on the, on the edge of the wall, and then in the background of the compound sitting on the roofs. Um, so everybody is trying to get as high as they can, but uh, uh, some of those positions don't look particularly safe to me. Barbara, you talk about the various groups that are there, some of them putting on a display for the media. How would you judge the overall mood? The overall mood here, well, I don't know if, if it feels so much like mourning in, this, in the way it did when uh, Mr. Arafat's death was announced. It's much more the sense of a great big public gathering, and I think it's going to be one, uh, just sort of a rally for Yasser Arafat. I have the feeling he'd quite like to see things this way. He always called himself the leader of the Palestinians, even though the structures underneath him might have crumbled, uh, the, the sort of institutions. He felt as long as he was seen as the leader of the Palestinian people, he had nothing to worry about. And I, he'd probably quite like a sort of uh, so, somewhat chaotic, but certainly large popular gathering uh, to, to, to put him to rest at, at his burial site. Our World Affairs correspondent Mike Wardridge is with me here. Mike, there's not the angry scenes. They don't appear to be angry crowds, as was feared. No, they certainly don't. But, you know, just looking at some of these scenes, just those moments of uh, perhaps near anarchy, as obviously the security forces are having their difficulties controlling some of these numbers, I'm reminded of uh, another momentous uh, event in Palestinian history, and that was the departure of the PLO and its leadership from, from Beirut, from Lebanon in 1982. And I was down there on the dockside when they had to leave for, for Tunis eventually at that time. I immensely emotional scenes then. Huge numbers of people uh, came in, Palestinians in particular, much firing in the air. And, and 
it, 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 on that occasion, uh, it, the Palestinians trying to turn a watershed moment in their lives at that time, in many ways a moment of defeat into a moment of triumph. Now today, of course, the setting very different, the context with the uh, departure, with the death of their leader. But it's, of course, another even, even much more potentially watershed moment in the history of the Palestinians. So I think for that reason, we must we must, of course, expect the very kind of emotions that we are seeing uh, on display here. You, you were mentioning just a moment ago about this wooden structure that is reported to have collapsed, indeed with, with some injuries. Uh, obviously, that sort of thing is particularly what the security forces, what the authorities will try to prevent happening, but certainly no, nothing that we're all aware, of, aware of at the moment that could suggest that this is turning ugly in any other way. A day of mourning, obviously, Mike. The focus today is on grieving for Yasser Arafat. But do you think there's a sense of looking forward to the future of what could be next and, and the exciting possibility that the Israelis are already talking about new negotiations with a new leader? Uh, you're right. I mean, there is perhaps what we might call a rhetoric at the moment about new turning point, new opportunities and so on, hearing it not only from the Israelis in the way that they're couching it. But historical, moment, heard, Arash, historical moment, Arash Sharon. Historical moment, Arash Sharon, that's right. And we're hearing the same sort of thing potentially from the Americans and others in commenting on Yasser Arafat's death. But I think that most people are urging caution in the midst of that, that rhetoric and talking more about the uncertainty of it all. It, it's going to be a, a testing time, surely, in, in so many ways for both the, the temporary new leadership of the Palestinians and whoever emerges from these elections as as outsiders would see it, how far can they, for example, contain uh, the militancy? How far can they see this, this process of elections through smoothly? The Palestinians, of course, would throw that back and say, this is going to be very testing for the Israelis. How far are they prepared to allow us to see these elections through? They say they want to see a new kind of leadership emerge. What are they going to do to, to relieve the miseries of daily life here, to actually allow uh, for the, to see through the practicalities that could allow the elections to take place. And if the uh, international community is indeed talking also about it being a turning point, what evidence is there going to be that in parallel with what we are doing here on the ground in the region, that there will be a greater engagement by the international community. So the crucial thing, I think, is that all of those things, will they all move forward simultaneously or will one party or another be, be making... Uh, uh, something conditional. So I, I think for that reason it is going to be a very uncertain period ahead rather than with any uh, guaranteed new momentum or return to the peace process. Barbara Blatt in Ramallah, you've been talking to people, Barbara, we've seen you over the past few days. This is a leader they've known for their whole lives. We hear Barbara has actually, not with us, Mike, but this is a man that many people have, has the only leader they've ever known. There must be a sense of nervousness, of uncertainty about what lies ahead. Precisely. I mean, and it's that fact that explains the scenes that we are witnessing now, why, why so many people have actually wanted to be there, if at all possible, in that compound uh, to, see, uh, to see this for themselves. And, and yes, I mean, so far there is the transition to uh, the, the process of succession is, is following the book, if you like. Um, but as, as we know, there are uh, Palestinian factions that are outside the equation at the moment, most notably Hamas, Islamic Jihad. They, of course, have a hold of their own over the Palestinian community. So uh, for, for many reasons, I think, uh, Palestinians would say the move from the only leader, leader they have known to a new leadership that has yet to achieve its own legitimacy, um, yet to be able to show that it can bring a meaningful, for many Palestinians, what it's really about, as much as a long-term peace, is uh, a, a relief in the pressures on their daily lives. Can that be delivered by a new leadership, and of course by the Israelis as well? Uh, along but with a, a better future. The Palestinian ha leadership have been talking to Hamas and Islamic Jihad in the past few days. Do you get the idea that this notion of inclusive leadership might be gaining momentum? Before you answer that, Mike, we're just watching scenes from Ramallah. of the funeral of Yasser Arafat. 
I'm Lise Doucette in Ramallah, where thousands of Palestinians are gathering today to say goodbye to the 75-year-old Palestinian leader. The day began with a short military funeral in the Egyptian capital, where dignitaries from around their world pay their last respects to Yasser Arafat. His body is now being flown here to Ramallah for his burial. Welcome to Ramallah on an emotional and historic day for the Palestinian people. And they have gathered here in the thousands in the Palestinian compound behind me to give the Arab leader a funeral as unique and unusual as the man they are honoring today, the man they call Abu Amar. It's a historic day, not just for the Palestinians, but for the entire Middle East. For some, 75-year-old Yasser Arafat was the defender of the Palestinian cause. For others, he was a dictator, and his enemies called him a terrorist. But for friend and foe alike, Yasser Arafat had come to personify the Palestinian struggle for a statehood. So today, as they remember Yasser Arafat, they pay tribute to the man and his history, but also to the cause that he represented. And so his last journey to the Middle East from a French military hospital in Paris, where he died on Thursday, the day began with a short and somber military funeral. Michael Voss now reports. Yasser Arafat's funeral began with a simple, short prayer service at a military mosque in Cairo. His coffin, draped in a Palestinian flag, was then placed upon a gun carriage in preparation for a military procession. Senior Palestinian figures greeted representatives from more than 40 countries who come to Egypt to pay their last respects. Amongst them, many Arab heads of state, including Syria's President Assad. Most of Europe, though, was represented at foreign minister level, including Britain's Jack Straw, while America sent an assistant secretary of state. This was a state funeral for a leader without a state. Admire or revile him, the world could not ignore Yasser Arafat, nor forget the Palestinian cause. Security was tight. The Egyptian public were not allowed on the streets as the procession followed the gun carriage on its short journey to a military airport. Tears from his widow Suha and nine-year-old daughter Zawa as Yasser Arafat's coffin was taken aboard an Egyptian Air Force plane for the latest stage on his journey to be buried in the compound in Ramallah. Michael Voss, BBC News. Well, the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan called Yasser Arafat the world's most instantly recognizable Palestinian leader. And when they paid tribute to him today, it was because of his impact, not just on Palestinian politics, but the entire half century of history here in the Middle East. And indeed, his impact went far beyond the borders of this region. But here today in the Palestinian areas, here in the West Bank, they will call him Abu Amar by his nom de guerre, the name he used during his decades of struggle as a guerrilla fighter, bravely infiltrating Israeli territory in his battle to form a Palestinian state. And yet it was in the last decade that he put down his gun, at least he said he did, and turned to the negotiating table. He signed a peace deal with Israel in 1993, the Oslo Peace Accords, an interim accord which was meant to eventually end in a Palestinian state. He has died without realizing that dream. And yet you can see the thousands of Palestinians who have gathered here in Ramallah today still want to pay homage to the only leader most Palestinians have ever known. For the last four decades, Yasser Arafat came to embody their deepest dreams and aspirations for a Palestinian state. He will be buried here in a few hours' time, 
here in the Palestinian compound where he lived and worked as a virtual prisoner for the past few years. Earlier today, security forces were unable to keep the crowds back. They have overrun this compound. The compound which was under Israeli siege for the past three years. This is a compound where Palestinians could not enter. It was encircled by Israeli troops. Today, they have made this compound their own. And it is here there will be a shrine conducted built for Yasser Arafat. They say, however, it will only be a temporary shine. A Muslim cleric has brought soil from the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem to say to the world that eventually they hope that Yasser Arafat will be buried in Jerusalem. Al-Quds Sharif, he called it sacred Jerusalem. The East Jerusalem that he and the Palestinians still hope will be the eventual capital of a Palestinian state. Israel forbade the burial in Jerusalem and so it will be here today in Ramallah, in the midst of all these emotional crowds, that Yasser Arafat will be laid to rest. An extraordinary day in the history of the Middle East. A Middle East which has seen more than its share of turbulence, more than its share of historic events, the signing of interim peace deals, sieges and wars. With me here watching today's developments and waiting for the helicopter to arrive bearing the body of Yasser Arafat is a Palestinian analyst Moeen Rabani of the International Crisis Group. And Moeen, as we watch uh, these crowds behind us, absolutely extraordinary show of support behind Yasser Arafat. Certainly, and I think after the um, official ceremony that we had in Paris yesterday and um, the official ceremony in Cairo today, this may well be the only opportunity, or it is indeed the only opportunity for the people themselves uh, to participate in the entire burial ceremony. And I think that explains the surge of thousands of Palestinians we've seen towards this compound. And as we've watched uh, here, Moeen, for the last few hours, the crowds gathering, it's undeniable that the emotions are also rising. Palestinians even saying that vowing to carry the body of Yasser Arafat to Jerusalem. Indeed, the emotions are becoming extremely, uh, are beginning to get strengthened over the course of the day. And I think we now have to ask ourselves uh, whether he will indeed be buried here or whether his supporters will make an attempt to take his coffin towards Jerusalem. And yet we see behind us uh, the secu Palestinian security forces trained in the last few years, one of the symbols of statehood, the state that Yasser Arafat wanted to build. Uh, will they be able to hold the crowds back? No, and I think that's also one of the symbols of how weakened the Palestinian Authority and its security forces have become as a result of repeated Israeli attacks upon them over the past four years. Quite clearly, um, Arafat supporters have already managed to overrun his compound, and I don't think the security forces are going to be in a, in a position to keep everything in check today. Now we can see behind us, uh, you may hear the, the rising din of noise uh, every time it seems as though Yasser Arafat is about to arrive. The people, the cries go up from the crowds and in the last uh, few seconds you, we, there's a definite stirring here. People waving the flags in the air. Can't see from where we are standing but I think this may herald uh, the imminent arrival of the Palestinian leader who's coming by helicopter from Al Arisha in the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt. Um, he, we expect if that journey will take uh, not much more than an hour. And indeed, the helicopters are circling overhead. The chants going up from the crowds. We will fight with our blood and our tears for Yasser Arafat. Moin, this is one of the rallying cries of Arabs across the region. Indeed, and the rallying cry reads that we will sacrifice our bloods and our souls for you, O Abu Ahmad. And we've heard people chanting his name and indeed um, chanting expressions of support for him all morning. And I think um, now this will all be reaching a crescendo. It's, uh, we obviously, there's obviously a signal that the helicopters are about to arrive and the crowds are pushing ever closer to the compound. The marching bands behind us now are marching across uh, the compound. The space has been cleared for the helicopters. Uh, 
I think this is the kind of funeral Yasser Arafat would have wanted. The people are, are threatening to take over. Indeed, the combination of full military honors in France yesterday and in Cairo this morning, and now um, the people coming to bid their final respects to him, I think is precisely what he would have wanted. The only event like this was when his helicopter appeared in the skies over Gaza in 1994 when he ended three decades in exile and returned to the Palestinian territories. And now this is his final journey home. We can see the skies now. The, we expect two helicopters coming from the Sinai Peninsula bringing Yasser Arafat, bringing his closest aides with him those who have been his friends and allies for decades here. And I'm also joined here in Ramallah by Riyad Malki, a Palestinian activist and now an academic. Riyad, it's truly historic. It is really historic. It's, uh, uh, it's in a moment, it's a different moment that uh, uh, we are passing today after 40 years of uh, uh, Arafat's control over uh, power in Palestine. It's a moment that, you know, the Palestinians will live today without Arafat with them. And that's why it's very historic that, you know, people are yet, they are not really aware of the challenges that they will face the day after. Still, they are really in this feeling of really frustration, disappointment, uh, uh, pain. They are trying to reflect through their presence today and, you know, this, the crowd that we see. But, you know, I'm not aware if they are aware uh, that what will happen tomorrow, the challenges that we are facing as Palestinian people, as Palestinian cause. I believe that, you know, we are going through a process of transformation and it's historic in that sense, too. Orkin, we have to say hysteric. It's now deafening the sound of the crowds in the compound just below us. Thousands and thousands of people pushing into the main square in the compound where we expect that helicopter to land and I think uh, there will be a certain amount of chaos as the helicopter comes closer to the landing pad that was built in the last 48 hours. It will of course uh, kick up a lot of dust and wind. Let's just listen to the crowds. the helicopter gets to the landing pad, the louder grow the crowds waiting in the compound below to say goodbye to Yasser Arafat. A momentous day in the Middle East. Thousands of Palestinians are watching this at the graveside. Thousands, millions more across the Middle East must be watching this on television. It is a day truly to remember Yasser Arafat's helicopter flying him from Egypt about to land here in Ramallah for his burial. There you see now the compound with the two circles where we expect the helicopters to land. Whether or not they can do so, the security forces are now struggling to keep the crowds back for safety reasons to ensure the helicopter is on. You see that that man has climbed up on the telephone poles. They're taking every position possible to get a view of this historic day. Palestinian flags in the crowds, people punching their fists in the air as Yasser Arafat prepares to land. Riyad Malki, Palestinians often said Yasser Arafat would live forever. It was a political slogan and now they're paying tribute and saying goodbye. They are saying really goodbye and uh, still without even believing that uh, he is really leaving them at all. There is still certain resistance among many Palestinians that uh, they cannot accept the fact that Arafat has left them for good. And that's why, you know, they are here just to, uh, to present his memory, you know, and to uh, uh, give him the last uh, uh, farewell to a leader that, you know, uh, has governed and has controlled the life of the Palestinian people for the last 40 years. So, yes, it is, in this sense, it's a reflection of that feeling among many Palestinians here.
And of course, Palestinians say that even more than their anthem, even more than their flag, Yasser Arafat was the symbol of the Palestinians' quest for statehood. It almost seems extraordinary that we won't see anymore the man with, who had, wore his keffiyeh, his headscarf, in a way that nobody else did. This diminutive man, five feet, four inches tall, who was such a towering figure and quite an unusual character, a politician to the core. The Palestinian population is young. More than 60% of the Palestinian people are less than 29 years old, meaning that they know no one except Arafat. They have not seen anyone but Arafat, and the only leader that they have known was Arafat. And that's why it's very hard for them to just to accept the fact and, and really to, to, to live to this moment. Let's just watch now these pictures and listen to the crowds as they welcome Yasser Arafat home. He's come back to Ramallah. Control. Palestinian security forces wearing the Palestinian flag. Trying to keep the crowds away, they're not succeeding. The air is full of the sound of Kalashnikov rifles and firecrackers. Palestinians want to see their leader themselves. It's impossible to hold back this tide of emotion. Extraordinary scenes here in Ramallah, an historic day. You can see the smoke from the fire, the gunfire. Security forces did their best, but they were helpless in the face of this huge surge of Palestinian humanity. Palestinians had expected to hold some kind of an official ceremony that will be absolutely impossible. They have now completely taken over this compound where Yasser Arafat will be buried later today. Palestinian flags waving, hands punching the air. The Palestinian man 
the man who is now next in line to Yasser Arafat, Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, has now alighted from the helicopter, waving to the Palestinians. Farouk Kadumi also, we can see inside the helicopter, all of the most senior Palestinian officials coming out of that first helicopter to meet, to meet the crowds. With us here on BBC News on this historic day, an absolutely extraordinary moment in Palestinian history is Riyad Malki. Riyad, this is exactly what was expected. It couldn't have been any other way for the Palestinian leader. It's true, it's amazing, you know, we expected that, but not to that degree, it's impossible. I think, you know, uh, who are really uh, uh, firing right now are the security services, the security police, in order really to send people away. But it seems that the people are not really bothered by the, uh, the fire, you know, and that's why they are uh, coming closer and closer. The first persons that we've seen coming out of the first helicopter was uh, Minister Omar Sliman, who is the head of the uh, uh, security uh, in Egypt, and behind him was uh, Abu Mazen. And uh, until this moment, it seems that no one is able to get out. No one is able to get out of the uh, uh, helicopters. And it seems that we'll, it will take a few uh, minutes before they clear out, you know, the place. Saeb Arikat is trying to really to convince people to leave and to go, but it seems that it's impossible. No one is really listening to no one right this moment. It is very hard, very difficult. No one is going to accept orders at this moment because everybody wants to be so close to their beloved leader and they want to touch his body, they want to see him at the last minute, and it seems that it's going to be very difficult. It's a very hard moment for the people themselves, it's a very hard moment for the security services to prevent people from getting to their beloved leader. It's very hard for the Palestinian leaders also accompanying uh, Arafat to convince their people to let the program go uh, continue. In Islamic tradition, Yasser Arafat uh, should be buried before sunset here in Ramallah and it is a, a day of fasting for Palestinian Muslims. We're coming to the end of the holy month of Ramadan, but none of that is on the minds of these Palestinians. All they want is to get closer, as close as possible to the Palestinian leader to spend time with him in his final moments here in the compound where he lived a virtual prisoner for the past three years. You can hear the sound of firecrackers here, the chanting of people and guns, volleys of Kalashnikov fire in the air. There's absolutely no way any of this can be controlled. This is the popular farewell, the people's farewell to Yasser Arafat, Abu Amar. After that pomp and circumstance, the somber military funeral in Cairo, this is the real farewell to Yasser Arafat. A ceremony being watched around the world. I'm Lise Doucette in the Palestinian city of Ramallah on this historic day as Palestinians say goodbye to the 75-year-old leader Yasser Arafat. The Palestinian analyst Moeen Rabani is also with me here. Moeen Rabani, a day not to forget. Indeed, one, um, according to what we heard of the initial arrangements, um, the body would lie in state for some time before being moved to its burial place. I think with this situation it seems increasingly clear that if uh, the Palestinian officials don't succeed in moving the coffin from uh, the helicopter straight to, straight to um, the burial place, that it may well be taken control of by his uh, devoted supporters. And then we have to see whether it's to honor him here or indeed to try to take the coffin to uh, Jerusalem.
That is the reason why Israel is on high security alert today, the highest security alert since a wave of suicide bombings in 2002. They've reinforced uh, the checkpoints uh, surrounding the city of Ramallah and certainly the checkpoints that lead to Jerusalem to prevent any attempts by Palestinians to try and force their way to Jerusalem to carry out their pledge to take the coffin of Yasser Arafat, to carry it on their shoulders and bury him where he wanted. In East Jerusalem, the city, only about a half hour's drive from here, where Palestinians had hoped to establish the capital of a Palestinian state. This is all they have, this compound here in Ramallah. It's the main Palestinian headquarters. It was where Yasser Arafat lived and worked under Israeli siege for the past three years. It was here that they chose to be the place where Yasser Arafat would be buried temporarily, they say, and a shrine would be built in honor of their leader. They say this place, the Makata, which was originally a British military headquarters when Britain ran this area during the mandate period, the 1920s, 30s and 40s. The Jordanians also used it as a military base when they took over the West Bank. The Israelis had it and now it's the Palestinians. And as you see today, it's become the burial ground, the place of homage for Palestinians to say goodbye to Yasser Arafat. Moin Rabani, the Palestinian analyst, is with me. Moin, Palestinians from all walks of life would venture into that square, that crush of people today? Indeed, I think, as we can see, the crowd primarily consists of uh, young men, um, the proverbial Shabab. But at the same time, we have seen people uh, from all walks of life, including women, children, young, the elderly, clergymen, and, uh, and so on. I think one of the reasons that the crowd is limited compared to what we might have expected is because there are reports that Israel has imposed a very severe closure on the city, precisely because Israel is adamant that the Palestinians have no right to bury their president, their deceased president, in um, occupied East Jerusalem, which for them will be the capital of their future independent state. And um, these reports indicate that very many people, not only from other areas of the West Bank, but also from the Gaza Strip, would very much have liked to come and pay their rest, last respects to him here today. But that, unfortunately, it seems not to be possible. And indeed, uh, Israel said that if Israelis wanted to attend the funeral today, peace activists who knew Yasser Arafat, uh, they could come, but they had to sign a waiver that Israel would not be responsible for their security. But I think it goes without saying that this ceremony here in Ramallah, this surge of emotion, this wave of people, this crush in the Palestinian compound is being watched every moment by Israel. Let's go now to Jerusalem to join my colleague Richard Myron, who's there. Uh, Richard, uh, Israeli television is live, Israeli radio is live on these pictures, on these sounds from Ramallah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there is enormous interest uh, here in Israel, Lise, uh, with these events in Ramallah. Israelis really do understand, I think, maybe not quite obviously like Palestinians, but they understand this is a momentous day in many respects. Um, Ariel Sharon will be the very first Israeli Prime Minister since 1967, since Israel conquered the West Bank and Gaza Strip, who will not be dealing with Yasser Arafat obliquely or directly um, as head of the Palestinian people. And Israelis are sitting there, I think, with some anxiety um, about what the future holds for them in their dealings with the Palestinians. And they'll be watching these pictures and they'll be realizing how important it is this day for the Palestinians and indeed for them as they think, I think they try to navigate a path uh, with the future Palestinian leadership. And I think they'll obviously be looking at these events, uh, how things aren't in control and wondering if a future for Palestinian leadership will be able to control its people politically and on the ground in the coming months and, and in the coming years. And yes, Richard, uh, as you mentioned, every Israeli leader since the establishment of the Jewish state had to deal in one way or another with Yasser Arafat. And yet, Ariel Sharon did everything possible not to deal with him. Uh, he called him a terrorist. Uh, like the United States, he called him an obstacle to peace, and they shut him out. Uh, what message will they take then from these pictures here today? 
I think Ariel Sharon will be satisfied that in a way he is left on the political stage and Yasser Arafat is absent. He will, say, he will be saying to himself, Yasser Arafat emerged with nothing. I am the man left in power. I am the man who will be making this, the decisions about what happens to the West Bank and Gaza Strip. But there are words of caution from many politically within Israel, from many com political commentators who said now that Ariel Sharon will be tested. His mettle will be tested. It's not now about him versus Yasser Arafat. It's about him seeking a solution now. And he, uh, Ariel Sharon has talked about the opportunity. And many commentators are, sh uh, are now saying within Israel, well, what are you going to make of this opportunity? What are you going to do? Because most Israelis want to resolve the problem of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. They're very much divided about how to go about doing that. And I think that Ariel Sharon will be sitting there today, like all of us, looking at these pictures. But with him, he'll be realizing that he has the power to change, to, to mold what happens now to the Jewish state and to the Palestinians. And obviously everybody will be wondering about how he will go about doing that. What opportunities will he be doing? What, what opportunities will he be giving to the new Palestinian leadership to ease, their pa uh, to ease their passage towards establishing their power? Not by making himself too close to them. Also at the same time, um, by doing various things, for example, maybe uh, uh, limiting the closures, allowing more freedom of movement, possibly releasing some political prisoners to enhance the status of this new leadership. There are uh, lots of possibilities for Ariel Sharon. I'm sure he'll be thinking about exactly how he's going to address the new Palestinian leadership, what that's going to mean for the Palestinians and indeed for Israelis. Richard Myron, thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, from Jerusalem. Uh, of course, the city only about a half hour's drive from here where Yasser Arafat would have wanted to be buried, but you can understand why Israel didn't want uh, these crowds, this surge of Palestinian emotion to descend on the Jewish the site that Israel regards as its most holiest site, the Jewish site, the Temple Mount compound, which is the third holiest site in Islam, the Haram al-Sharif, uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, in the old city of Jerusalem. Now we've seen in the last uh, few minutes desperate attempts by the security forces to try to make their way to push these crowds apart, even driving a car straight into them. They simply cannot open the door of the helicopter. We see the chief Palestinian negotiator, Saya Barakat, gripping the doors and urging Palestinians to move away to allow them even to push the gate down. You can see him now gesturing to the crowds. It's, I'm afraid it's falling on deaf ears. Zai Barakat doing his best to, to try to restore some kind of order here in Ramallah as the sun slowly begins uh, to set in the afternoon uh, on a truly amazing day, an extraordinary historic day for the people of this Palestinian city. Indeed, for the millions of Palestinians across the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, in exile around the world, some eight million Palestinians will be watching every step, every event of this amazing day here in Ramallah. You're watching BBC News and our special coverage of the last journey of Yasser Arafat to Ramallah and the efforts uh, to bury him later today as the sun sets in his compound here in Ramallah. With me here, just on the edge of that compound, is Riyad Malki, the Palestinian analyst. Riyad, I, I, can't, I just can't imagine how they're going to actually, beside those crowds, to allow them to, the Palestinian officials, to leave that helicopter, much less to bring out the body of Yasser Arafat. It's going to be very difficult, very hard. I, uh, we have been watching in you know, cyber area trying really even to open the doors and he failed. So it's going to take time and you know the time is passing by and it's very risky if we will stay in this kind of stalemate for a while. I think you know the security people they have to work hard and they have to really to push people out, away from the helicopters in order to take the body out. Otherwise you know we are losing time and time is very precious here. I think this is really a very difficult moment for people, you know, to try to convince them 
to uh, go away from the helicopter and not to be close to their beloved leader. It's very hard and it's taking a lot long time, longer time and even taking longer effort from everybody to convince people to open the way to the body out of the helicopter. It seems that they are not uh, succeeding yet and it might take another maybe 10 to 15 minutes before we can see that yes, the door will be open and uh, the program will go back to its normality and then things will, uh, will, uh, will continue. But it seems that it is a matter of maybe 10, 15 minutes further before we could see that things will be settled down. And we have that threat uh, hovering in the air of Palestinian militants who are vowing to take the body of Yasser Arafat on their shoulders and march uh, to Jerusalem. A short time ago, we saw Palestinians with their faces covered with kafiyas holding their guns in the air, marching through the crowds. These are the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades who've now renamed themselves the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades and the martyrs for the, the Brigade for the Martyrs of Yasser Arafat, uh, renaming themselves in homage uh, to the Palestinian leader. They, uh, some of those who are now f firing those volleys of Kalashnikov gunfire into the air. There is, in addition to the emotional outpouring of grief, there's also a very menacing atmosphere there with so many weapons in the crowd and such an outpouring of emotion for the Palestinian leader. Let's see now a closer picture of the helicopter. They seem to have been able to clear a small space to allow perhaps the officials to make their way out of the helicopter and of course the most difficult part hasn't even been started and that is to actually take the coffin out of the helicopter and I think we can begin to imagine what the reaction of the crowds will be once they catch sight of the coffin draped with a Palestinian flag and the efforts by officials to take it to a more secure place I think they may have to abandon their efforts to allow Yasser Arafat to lie in state and have a file passed of Palestinian officials who'd like to say goodbye in a more dignified way to the Palestinian leader. I think the crowds here today have indicated they want these last few hours to get as close as possible to their leader. They want to take over this funeral. And perhaps in a way that's what Yasser Arafat would have wanted. He really wanted to be seen as the man of the people. They often called him Abu Amar by his no daguerre. With me here watching our these extraordinary scenes unfolding in the Palestinian compound. We're speaking just from the edge of that compound, which is now completely filled by a surge of people. Moin Rabani, Palestinian analyst, is here with me. Moin, they seem to be making small progress in getting the crowds to, to move back a little bit, but it's, it's not enough. Indeed, and I think one of the questions that this addresses is the, is the nature of the relationship uh, between the new Palestinian leadership and the Palestinian people. From the preparations that we've seen being made here in the last few days, it seemed that the Palestinian Authority, that the new Palestinian leadership, would have liked to bury Yasser Arafat with a more or less official ceremony, and that the participation of the people could only take place after the burial by way of paying uh, condolences to the new leader. What we've seen now is his lead is there we have uh, once again the chief Palestinian negotiator Sa'ab Arakat and if I'm seeing correctly a member of the PLO executive committee uh, Yasser Abed Rabbo. and what we've seen here is Arafat's supporters indeed coming to take possession of their departed leader coming to take possession of his funeral and seeking to take possession of the symbolism of this event now of course we don't know what will happen um, there, the door is finally opened. We, of course, don't know what will happen when the coffin finally emerges. And there's uh, PLO Executive Committee Yasser Abed Rabbo, and behind him, his office director, uh, Ramzi Khouri. Um, but what we do know is that for Palestinians as a whole, Israel's insistence upon refusing a burial in um, the 
Haram al-Sharif, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, was for many the final indignity after everything that um, he had been made to suffer through in terms of siege and virtual imprisonment during the past uh, several years. And here it seems that um, finally some progress is uh, being made. This is the moment the coffin is emerging. Let's listen now to the reaction. Yasser Arafat has returned home to the Palestinian compound, welcomed by his people, the Palestinians who have taken over this funeral ceremony to say a last goodbye to Abu Amar the Palestinian leader who has led their struggle for the past four decades. An absolute sea of people who have crushed into that compound in the last several hours. They're carrying the body with them, moving through the crowds, the coffin bearing the body of Yasser Arafat, covered by the Palestinian flag, black, white, green, and red. Security forces struggling to keep order. It's an absolutely helpless situation for this newly trained security forces. They've been trained by Yasser Arafat's authority to provide security for an emerging Palestinian state. And today they struggle to keep order as Palestinians honor the man who never achieved that state, but led their struggle to achieve one. With me here watching the procession as it tries to make its way through this crush of people is the Palestinian commentator, Riyad Malki. We can see that uh, the flag that is really being raised you know, next to the coven is the uh, personal flag that was used on many occasions by uh, Arafat himself. And you could distinguish the flag from the many other flags. And it seems that, you know, they wanted to accompany that, uh, uh, the flag with the coffin until it reaches its destination. It's very interesting to see that while we were watching people moving in this compound, that there are many other flags next to the Palestinian flag. We have seen Iraqi flag, we have seen Egyptian flag, we have seen Saudi flag, we have seen French flag, and uh, also, I believe that uh, we have seen uh, uh, Jordanian flags. These were flags that were raised next to the Palestinian flag in a way to reflect, you know, uh, uh, the solidarity and uh, to, to, to give th thanks to the uh, governments and peoples that they have been accompanying and helping the Palestinians in the last two weeks, especially in dealing with the sickness of President Arafat. Uh, of course, it's very hard to see who's right now in control of the coffin. It's no, we have no idea if it's still in the hands of his security people, the guards, or the masses. And even if the masses are in control, then you know we know we know for sure where the masses would like to take the coffin. They would like to to be headed towards Jerusalem to be buried there. But it seems that uh, uh, the, the, the number of security people around who are trying to maintain control over the, the, uh, the, the path of the coffin, that they are uh, in control of it right now. And it seems that, that they will try to uh, shorten the program that they have really prepared in order really not to fall in many uh, uh, risks that uh, we have really seen in the last uh, half an hour since you know, the landing of the two helicopters. We, we saw also right now Canadian flag uh, being also raised uh, in a way that uh, uh, people are trying to send their thanks to so many countries, to so many peoples that they have been standing you know, uh, uh, with the Palestinian people, the Palestinian struggle, and also they have shown solidarity to the imprisonment of their beloved uh, leader for so many years. It's clear that, you know, we are seeing 
people moving, masses moving, thousands of people moving without even knowing where the coffin is, is right now, in which destination. It's very clear that they are heading towards the compound itself, where it's going to be late to rest for about a year, uh, an hour or two in order for uh, all the beloved ones to s give him the last uh, uh, scene and then he will uh, be buried exactly uh, next to the uh, uh, tree that it, uh, it will uh, cover uh, him uh, during the different seasons of the year. They have chosen that important tree in the middle of the compound in order for that tree to give him shadows during you know, uh, different days of the year. It's very symbolic to see the location of the uh, where they are going to be buried and it's uh, very symbolic to see the different flags that were raised particularly at this particular moment where it is moment of truth. The last journey of Yasser Arafat and as you can see even the security forces can't help but get caught up in the emotion of the day. They were the people who defended Yasser Arafat and they'll defend him on his last journey, his resting place here in Ramallah. The chant that they have chanted on so many times before, we will defend you with our blood and with our, our sweat, our leader Yasser Arafat. This is a day undoubtedly watched by Palestinians, the millions of Palestinians, not just here in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, but there's some four million Palestinians who live in exile. Some of them, the refugees who had hoped Yasser Arafat would keep his promise to give them a state in the Palestinian territories that they could return to. Let's just bring in now a Palestinian who's watching from afar in, in London, Barry Ali Moudin, who knew Yasser Arafat very well, who like millions of Palestinians around the world is watching this momentous occasion, this emotional outpouring for the 75-year-old leader Yasser Arafat. Barry Ali Moudin, uh, just join us with your reflections on this extraordinary event. If I might just say, I'm Lebanese uh, who has always uh, uh, you know, felt what Yasser Arafat felt and many Palestinians and sympathized with the cause as such and have interviewed him many times, met him many times and I cannot but remember the last interview I had with him here in, in, in London uh, where he was still speaking with such enthusiasm about peace and about the security forces and about the help he was hoping to get from the European Union to have even more of these security forces trained and, and indeed establishing order and, and security for his people. I, I was also very touched when I saw the crowds in Lebanon and could not help but remember the very reason why Yasser Arafat could not sign to the peace he was asked to sign uh, to indeed uh, give up their right for return. I'm a Lebanese and have always seen the, Leban the Palestinians suffer in their camps on the border of, of Lebanon being bombarded and killed by Israeli uh, planes and, and uh, wars. I also cannot but remember Yasser Arafat telling me you have to come and visit me in Jerusalem. I want to live in Jerusalem and die in Jerusalem. I cannot but reflect on his pride in his people, on his uh, simple belief that every Palestinian will give his blood, his soul, as you have been hearing, for the cause. Uh, I think also one has to reflect also today on, on the feelings of all these Palestinians that are not able to be there. It's very important for these people indeed in such a day to feel that they are close to the coffin, to the body of Yasser Arafat. I do understand very much what is going through their minds and souls. This is the only leader they have known. This is the only man who had given their, his life to achieve a peaceful settlement to have his Palestinian democratic state to live side by side with Israel. I cannot but reflect on the very, very sad moments in his life 
especially when he was imprisoned the last three years in his life in Al Muqata, as, as you know. Th those are very, very sad moments in every human being's life who aspires for peace and justice in the world. And Barry Ali Moudin, as we see the pictures of Yasser Arafat uh, waving in the crowds, uh, we remember, of course, that he was a man who lived by symbols, the way he wore his kefia, the checkered headscarf. They said it was in the shape of Palestine, the way he always uh, insisted on wearing military fatigues. He never would put on a business suit, as people had urged him to do, to send a signal to Israel, to the rest of the world, that he was interested in making peace through negotiations and not uh, through armed struggles. And perhaps uh, this emotional outpouring is another symbol that he himself would have wanted, uh, the people coming to say goodbye, even in this most uh, chaotic uh, of fashions. It couldn't have been any other way, could it? Uh, the last interview I had with him in Tunisia before he went to Gaza, and he uh, specifically, I asked him, aren't you going to give your, your uh, fatigue, uh, your, your military fatigue and, and, and wear a normal suit like any other uh, president? He suggested that he will never remove that, that fatigue. And then I reflected, I said, what if you have your Palestinian state? What if you have full control of, of a Palestinian state, a democratic Palestinian state? He said, we, we should wait for that day. But he sounded always suspicious of Israeli intentions toward peace, uh, Liz. And yes, his kufi, I, I remember watching him many, many times, taking his time to make it exactly the shape of the Palestinian uh, map, if you like. He always made, wanted to make sure that it exactly looked like the map of, of Palestine. This was the shape, the way he dressed his kufi, indeed. Here in Ramallah, there's the deafening noise now of the firecrackers, the Kalashnikov rifles being fired in the air. Palestinians using whatever means possible to say their last uh, goodbye to Yasser Arafat. A huge throng of people now moving with the coffin as it slowly makes its way through the compound. You can still see some of the bulldozers there who worked uh, so frenetically over the last 48 hours to clear a burial ground. And it's hard to imagine now that early this morning that whole area was cleared to make way for two military helicopters to arrive and for there to be a dignified burial for the Palestinian leader. They had even rolled out a red carpet optimistically hoping that they would be able to clear a passage for a solemn last goodbye to the Palestinian leader. But many of us here who've watched uh, the crowds from the early hours of the morning gathering here and the rising emotions knew that uh, there was always the risk uh, that it would end like this. Riyadh Malki, complete chaos it has to be said now. Even the security forces uh, trying to push that coffin along are having a very, very difficult time. There we can see now the officials moving through the crowds, the legation who were in Cairo for the military funeral earlier today. And now are even they, their words fall on deaf ears here in the crowds. You're watching live coverage from Ramallah on BBC News of a very momentous day, not just here in Ramallah, but across the entire Middle East, the end of an era and many hope the opening of a new chapter. But for now, at this moment, it is a moment of grief. It is the people's moment, the Palestinians saying goodbye to Abu Amar. Palestinian analyst uh, Riyad Malki is, is with me here as we watch uh, at the very edge of this compound. It seems that they have uh, changed their minds because at the, at the first moment, they drove towards the, uh, the compound inside but it seems that you know the, the vehicle is moving right now back and they are heading towards the town. So it seems that they have uh, decided to shorten their program and to cut the program related to uh, allowing people to, to see him. And they are right now heading towards the town. And it seems that it's right now the last uh, episode of the whole event where the body will be laid down to rest in that town.
So uh, it seems that uh, right now um, there are people whom uh, uh, they are still uh, around preventing this uh, event to really develop in the right uh, uh, form. But also there are a lot of people who have really lost hope to be close to the body, to touch him and to see him for the last uh, uh, time. And that's why it seems that a lot of people right now are uh, uh, leaving the compound, uh, heading towards their homes, especially if they came from far distance because they want to be there before uh, uh, the break of the fast, the end of the uh, uh, day of Ramadan. And uh, this might uh, give uh, more space uh, to the people, the security people and to the Palestinian Authority uh, officials in order really to manage uh, to bury the body in the, in the right form. Uh, right now we have seen uh, uh, the top uh, uh, officials of the PA. Uh, I was able to see quickly uh, Abu Mazen, uh, Abu Ala and Nabil Shaf being really pushed by uh, the security uh, people uh, to be close to the tomb before uh, uh, the barrier will take place. of Yasser Arafat still draped by the Palestinian flag and now draped with a whole core of Palestinian security forces wearing a band of the Palestinian flag around their waists hoping to restore enough order here to allow the Palestinian leader to be buried before sunset and it is a day of fasting for the Palestinian Muslims it's coming to the end of the holy month of Ramadan and this will be a funeral which will of course be carried out in Islamic tradition. Riyad Malki, just tell us what will be the Muslim ceremonies which will have to be observed at some point before the burial of Yasser Arafat. Well obviously uh, there will be uh, the uh, religious clerks who will be there uh, waiting and before uh, the body will be uh, laid down they have to pray uh, uh, for, uh, for his soul and uh, to have to uh, read some verses of uh, the Quran and but what's what's important of all of that that uh, uh, the body itself has to be laid down and not the coffin uh, in Muslim tradition uh, uh, bodies are not really laid down with coffin, they have to be taken out of the coffin and laid down uh, as they are, uh, covered with the white sheet uh, uh, and uh, then they will, uh, uh, the body will be completely buried. When, when they finish that, uh, the, uh, again the, uh, uh, the religious uh, uh, clerks will uh, 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 pray and will read some verses of the Quran and then this will be the culmination and the end of the uh, barrier events. You're watching BBC News and our special coverage of Yasser Arafat's final journey home to Ramallah in the heart of the West Bank. I, I don't, I don't to the compound, so. the Makata, where he lived and worked for the past three years, a virtual prisoner under Israeli siege. The Israelis always said that Yasser Arafat could leave if he wanted to, but it was never clear if he could be allowed to return. It was only on October the 29th, when he fell to a serious illness, that he finally left to a French military hospital, where he died overnight on Thursday of an illness that still has not been properly diagnosed and made public. One of his aides said that Yasser Arafat had lived a very difficult life, a euphemism perhaps. And here we see today Palestinians converging now on a coffin which has been taken, the Palestinian flag has been taken off it. The funeral of Yasser Arafat. If you're watching our live coverage in the United Kingdom, the coverage will continue on News 24. And there will be a full report on the one o'clock news on BBC One. But this is BBC special coverage of an historic day for Palestinians and indeed the entire world is watching.
as Palestinians say their last goodbye to their Palestinian leader. You're watching BBC News and our special coverage of this extraordinary day unfolding here in Ramallah, in the heart of the West Bank. The wooden coffin of Yasser Arafat, no longer draped with the green, red, white and black Palestinian flag. And now Palestinians are throwing on top of it the checkered kefiyeh headscarf. The Palestinian leader first wore a wet, white headscarf in the 1930s as he began his political activism and then he adopted at this checkered kefiyeh that became not just his identifying uh, uh, signature but it also became a symbol of the Palestinians aspiration for statehood and ever since news came from Paris as dawn broke here on Thursday morning Palestinians across the West Bank and the Gaza Strip also put on the checkered kefiyeh to pay their respects to the man they call Abu Amar the father of the Palestinian people Yasser Arafat who was unique it has to be said in so many ways a diminutive figure just five feet four inches tall and a man who towered not just over the Palestinian political landscape but the entire Middle East and today on this day the entire region must be watching a day where the people have taken over the day to say we want to say goodbye to Yasser Arafat in a way we think befits our leader. Palestinians, of course, are watching most closely. With me here in Ramallah is a Palestinian analyst who works with the international crisis group Moyin Rabani. You were asking me earlier what uh, he would, what Arafat would have thought of this burial. I think this kind of chaotic adulation is precisely what he would have wanted. I think he would love every minute of it. And I think we should also point out that he's perhaps the last of the generation of nationalist leaders who came to the fore in the 1950s and the 60s. I think indeed it's impossible to conceive of another current Arab leader getting a funeral as this one with a popular adulation involved and indeed any of his successors uh, being treated this way. And now we continue to see a sea of uh, Palestinian flags, uh, commemorative gunfire in the background, as the casket is brought ever closer to what Palestinians insist is its final resting place but one, because they insist that he will still be undertaking a final journey to Jerusalem when it becomes the capital of an independent Palestinian state. Now, increasing uh, amounts of commemorative uh, gunfire, and we're seeing people trying to get close to at least uh, touch the casket. And eventually, um, as Riyadh said, uh, the casket will be open, and the body of Yasser Arafat, covered only in a white shroud, according to Muslim tradition, will then be removed from it and placed inside uh, the tomb here in uh, the Muqata, the governorate compound in uh, Ramallah in the occupied West Bank. Now we can no longer see the, the special grave site which was prepared in the last 48 hours for Yasser Arafat. But it is a marble tomb and a Muslim cleric from the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem brought some special soil, uh, another symbol for the Palestinian leader, so they could say at least he was buried in the soil of Jerusalem, even though he couldn't fulfill his wish to be buried in the Haram al-Sharif, uh, the Temple Mount compound. As Muin Rabani mentioned, this is not just a funeral for the leader of the Palestinian people, it's also the last of the funerals for a generation of Arab leaders who forged politics in this region ever since the establishment of the Jewish state in 1948. So it's a, a truly historic day for this in, entire region. Let me just bring in my colleague Paul Adams, a former Middle East uh, correspondent who's watched over the years as Yasser Arafat uh, tried uh, unsuccessfully to achieve uh, his dream of, of a Palestinian state. Uh, Paul, uh, you've seen many of these emotional, chaotic situations with Palestinians before here in the West Bank, but nothing quite like this. 
No, I was just thinking, Lee, that this is, if you like, a, a classic martyr's funeral. This is like so many of the, the big funerals that have taken place uh, during the Palestinian uprising. And in some ways, I think that's probably how many of the Palestinians want it. They want it to be this kind of passionate, chaotic uh, occasion led in some ways by the street and not by the authorities. Uh, I think that what we've been watching there with this sea of Palestinians, some of them in uniform, some of them not, is, if you like, indicative of the, the, the chaotic nature of Palestinian society today, where you have a kind of rudimentary security apparatus, large in numbers but not terribly well organized, trying to exert authority over a turbulent factional street and frankly not able to do it. There have been moments in the last hour when it seemed as though the street was, was going to take over in its entirety and I think what we're seeing at the end is a, a mixture of the authorities and the, and the public. They're doing this together and I think in a, in a funny kind of way that's how Yasser Arafat and many Palestinians would want it. Chaotic and, and bizarre though it seems to us watching from the outside. But it does underline uh, the, how raw the emotions are, Paul. And of course, it will take time for these emotions to subside because they are an outpouring of grief for the Palestinian leader, but also for the dreams, uh, the promises he made to his people, which still remain unrealized. And when Palestinians go back to their homes, they may have to go through Israeli checkpoints. They still live in an area under Israeli occupation. and much as, of course, even Palestinians will admit that Yasser Arafat made mistakes. He didn't uh, perhaps do everything possible. He didn't adapt to the demands of, of peacemaking. But still, uh, they, will, they will now look to their new leaders with perhaps even less patience to achieve those goals. That's right. They won't give those new leaders that much time. The, the Palestinians are weary and impatient and they will want Abu Mazen and Abu Allah and the others to do something that Yasser Arafat couldn't do and whether frankly they have that ability is very very questionable. Um, th this, is, this is a day when you sort of look at the scenes and one talks about this being the end of an era. Yes it is but you're right the reality on the ground is the same. As you say they will go home and they will face the same difficulties of checkpoints and one thinks to the wider Palestinian diaspora those desperate Palestinians watching in Lebanon who know frankly that they have no chance at least not in the in the immediate or even distant future of a return to their homes they are the ones who feel that Yasser Arafat failed to deliver their dreams they probably heard in the last few years as Yasser Arafat's negotiators carried on the process even after the, the formal collapse of the peace process carried it on and and found ways of negotiating even about that precious thing, the Palestinian right of return. So ordinary life, the, 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 the frustrations, the difficulties of ordinary life for Palestinians remain exactly the same after today as they were before. And uh, yes, it is. these are extraordinary scenes which everyone will be watching, everyone will be wondering what is the Palestinian leadership going to be like after this? Will this have been a a cohesive, unifying uh, crucible of an occasion in which the Palestinians will emerge stronger? Or will it be a, a day in which Yasser Arafat's grip, however, in latter years, however tenuous, on the disparate strands of Palestinian politics and society will have been loosened? Uh, are we looking at a more chaotic, more fragmented Palestinian world after his death? It's hard to imagine, uh, Paul, uh, how these emotions uh, will subside. And of course, uh, they'll leave their mark because today, uh, if all goes as planned, Yasser Arafat will be buried, this temporary burial place. We can see now the trees uh, underneath there somewhere are the marble slabs, the tomb where Yasser Arafat is to be buried before sunset here in Ramallah. And that is only about two hours away. So we'll have to see a, what a significant improvement in the situation if they're to bury him. We see it, the crowds have cleared, at least in some part of the compound. They're going to try With and do it. With me here, just on the edge of that comp. 
No, they're going to try and do it, obviously, Lees, but you're right. It, it's, it's, it's proving harder and harder to actually see where they are in this whole process. You know, I was thinking, watching this, of a, of a Palestinian joke, which I remember hearing years ago uh, when I first arrived there, which is that Mr. Palestine, Yasser Arafat, when he dies and uh, reaches the afterlife, he turns back and looks at the world he's just left behind him and is surprised and a little dismayed to see that Palestine still exists on the map behind him. Uh, this notion that Yasser Arafat was Palestine uh, was, was a one deeply uh, embedded, if you like, in Palestinian society. He felt it, many, many Palestinians felt it. Of course, ironically, he did return uh, today to Palestine. He made one final trip back in that rather itinerant helicopter-born fashion that used to be so typical of his travels around the world in the days when he was a, a wandering leader in search of a state. He came back one last time to be buried as close as he will ever get to Jerusalem, the place that he thought he dreamed he might make his capital. Uh, but this is where it ends and uh, Mr. Palestine has gone and the Palestinian leadership that succeeds him and we're looking at some of those figures there, Saab Erekat, the chief Palestinian negotiator, uh, they will have to figure out what Palestine means without him. Yes, indeed, and when the sun sets on this day, when Yasser Arafat is laid to rest, Palestinians return to their homes and to the lives uh, which haven't changed in the way that they have hoped and worked for for the last few decades. Many are hoping that this will be an occasion for the start of a new chapter. And even Israelis, while too watching from afar, the ceremonies today have spoken of what could be a new era in the Middle East. Let's just bring in our colleague Richard Myron, who's uh, watching also from Jerusalem, about an hour's drive from Ramallah. Richard, no doubt uh, Israelis are glued to their television screens, uh, listening to their radios uh, to watch uh, every moment of this ceremony. And now we can see the pictures of these new leaders that Israel will have to work with. Mahmoud Abbas, uh, you can just see the, this white hair, he's now being given a kiss on both cheeks by some of the mourners here next to him, Abu Allah, Palestinian uh, Prime Minister. Two men who have been, were in exile for many decades with Yasser Arafat now. Prayers here being said as well. Richard, Mar let me just bring you in, Richard. Israel will be watching the faces of these new leaders and hoping, of course, Israel believes that it perhaps will be easier to deal with these two men we're seeing, Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, Ahmed Korea, Abu Allah, people described as pragmatists, but neither of them has the stature of Yasser Arafat. Both of them were architects of the interim peace deals with Israel, but will they actually be able to conclude a final peace deal? Well, I think that's the question that's going to be preoccupying Israeli policymakers and Israeli politicians here and now, Lise. How much can these people who we've been seeing, who you've been describing, um, how much can they carry the Palestinian street? And will they be able to control the militant elements? Um, Israel will be looking to these people for exactly that. And, and how much indeed the questions are, will Israel be able to do maybe to enhance their status? Or indeed, if it seemed to be moving too close to these individuals, Abu Mazen, that indeed may harm their stature in the eyes of Palestinians. But both those figures that you've, uh, that you've mentioned Mahmoud Abbas, also known as Abu Mazen, uh, the new head of the PLO, is a man known to Israel, is a man thought by Israel to be a pragmatist. Um, Shimon Peres, the head of the Labour opposition, said he respected both uh, Mahmoud Abbas and the Prime Minister, the Palestinian Prime Minister, Ahmed Korea, as Palestinian nationalists. They respect them, I think, in a way that they didn't respect Yasser Arafat. But at the same, same time, they're faced with this quandary. They realize that these two figures don't have the same place in the hearts of Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza, and throughout the Palestinian diaspora. Uh, and, and they're going to very much be hoping, I think, that these two people can, in the coming months, um, establish themselves um, in a different kind of way with Palestinians um, and so it's going to be a very I think Israelis are cautiously optimistic at the same time I think that optimism is tinged with an element of, of anxiety. Well, let's 
just uh, watch uh, these uh, pictures here now, the new generation of Palestinian leaders. With me here in Ramallah watching these scenes unfold is also the Palestinian expert, uh, Graham Asher. Graham, let's just comment on what's here with the leaders now pressing their way towards the tomb. Yes, what we, what we just saw was the... Um uh, Palestinian leadership, the new Palestinian leadership, and also significantly Omar Soleiman, who is the head of the Egyptian intelligence force, and a man who people expect to be very instrumental in any Israeli withdrawal from Gaza. Um, we are seeing basically them going towards the graveside. Arafat's coffin was taken to them, there was a short um, ceremony, and now we seem to be waiting for the final leg. Uh, that is where Arafat's coffin was taken, that's where various dignitaries have waited to pay their last respects to their leader. And when we see those, that huge crush of people, Graham, all united today in saying goodbye to Yasser Arafat, uh, it's also, we have to remember that they come also from different political factions and when the emotion subsides, it this will be the task of the new leaders to try to keep these factions united but there there are very disturbing signs are there not we're seeing now some of the more militant ones making their way through yes it's not just the question of the different palestinian factions there are the various divisions within um yasser arafat's fatah movement and the movement of um chairman Mabua, mahmoud abbas abul mazen and the prime minister abu allah um, what we see today are the various different strata of Fatah. You have the old guard leadership, which is very much represented by people like Abu Mazen. But you also see in their hundreds the younger Fatah people, including members of the various Fatah militias, and they're the ones firing the guns. And their attitude to, say, things like the Intifada, the armed resistance, are markedly different from Abu Mazen. Abu Mazen has always been opposed to the armed Intifada. He basically believes the only way the Palestinians can achieve their rights is through negotiations. The Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade believe very heavily in armed struggle. And of course the key to Yasser Arafat was that he straddled those two divides. He was somebody who was committed to negotiations but made it very clear that he saw armed resistance in the occupied territories as a legitimate form of Palestinian resistance. That was one of the reasons he could hold this movement together and it really is an open question whether Abu Mazen or Abu Allah can do that. They can do it for now when they're arranging for Yasser Arafat's funeral, but will they be able to do it when they have to take strategic questions, such as resuming negotiations with Israel, or trying in some way to stop the armed character of the uprising? So I think what we are seeing here is Fatah, is the, nas the main national movement, but we're also seeing the various divisions and tensions within it fought out for, in, in a way over in, in, in what we've seen as the control for Yasser Arafat's funeral. Who does it? Is it going to be dignified and ceremonial or is it going to be an expression of the masses? And so far it's been very much an expression of the masses. It is undeniable the people have taken over this funeral and made it their own, taking possession of every step of the way ever since Yasser Arafat's uh, helicopter arrived here against uh, the din of firecrackers and volleys of Kalashnikov fire and the chanting of Palestinians saying goodbye today to the 75-year-old Palestinian leader. We can see now some of the emergency vehicles making their way into the crowds. We've already seen some of the relief workers rushing by. It's not surprising that people, there would have been some injuries in there, even by the sheer crush of people, the heat of the day and the the proximity of all these people crushed together inside that compound. Now this is the scene outside. You can see that some people have begun to disperse. It's about an hour and a half away from sunset here. That is the time when Yasser Arafat should be buried. It's also the time of the breaking of the fast for Palestinian Muslims who are observing the holy month of Ramadan. Now we also saw pictures from inside the compound where in an atmosphere of more quiet and, and more dignified atmosphere, Palestinian officials trying to say goodbye to the Palestinian leader, trying to have a bit of decorum. Riyad Malki, the Palestinian commentator, is still with us here.
وفارسا Yes, it's true that uh, there is right now a very clear division. We have the new leaders of the Palestinian people, are, uh, all of them are inside the compound, while most of the masses, the people, are outside of the compound. And uh, this uh, by itself is not really a good sign when it comes to the type of future that we all expect. But anyway, it seems that also that right now we have seen a uh, number of people are entering into the compound and joining the new leaders of the Palestinian people all together to receive the different dignitaries who are there showing their condolences and solidarity. Uh, but also, it's very important to know that while we have witnessing you know, this official funeral, many Palestinians in different villages, cities, both in West Bank and Gaza, and because they were prevented from attending this official funeral, they have staged their own symbolic funerals. And in, we heard that in each village and city, there were symbolic funerals were prepared for the memory of their beloved leader, Yasser Arafat. So this is really very important uh, 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 information to know. We have also learned that the core uh, uh, cadres of Fatah, they try to stay the whole night uh, in the compound to try to uh, protect and to guard uh, the tomb that was uh, uh, just uh, erected for uh, the uh, President Arafat. And uh, it has been seen that the tomb was erected outside of the built compound in the in the space open space outside and that's why from a security point of view the location is not a most secured uh, place and uh, it requires to stage uh, guards to protect the tomb because it's really uh, uh, built in the open space outside the structure itself and that's why it seems that we will see tonight a lot of uh, scores of uh, Fatah uh, cadres that will stay the whole night trying to watch and to guard uh, the, the place as much as also the officials themselves chaotic scenes uh, in the compound there but we are getting reports now that the Quranic prayers have been chanted and that the body of Yasser Arafat has been put in the marble tomb the tomb which also has soil from Jerusalem it was brought by a Muslim cleric this morning we understand that Yasser Arafat has now been buried he's now been put in his resting place here in this compound you see filled with Palestinian people in the heart of the West Bank the prayers have been chanted in Islamic tradition and Yasser Arafat, the 75-year-old Palestinian leader who died in a French military hospital early on Thursday morning has now been laid to rest. Palestinians still crowding the compound. It must be very difficult for them to know what has been happening at the other end of the compound. People surge there this morning. You can see now people wearing the kafia, the checkered headscarf that the Palestinian leader made into a symbol of the Palestinian resistance. It was his trademark, and now so many Palestinians are wearing it on this day that they say goodbye. Palestinians often said that they believed Yasser Arafat would live forever and perhaps his influence will remain for a long time to come and indeed the new leaders which have emerged will have to come out of his shadow but still try in some way to inherit some of his legitimacy and stature if they are to carry on where he left off you can see the white hat of the Islamic cleric presiding over prayers as Yasser Arafat 
is buried in Ramallah, the V for victory sign of some of the Palestinian leaders. A crush of people around the gravesite. We come to you from Ramallah against the deafening sound of firecrackers and volleys of Kalashnikov fire. Let's just bring in one of the millions of Palestinians who's watching this uh, from a distance, but in our studios in London, Barry Ali Moudin. Barry Ali Moudin. Uh, yes, Liz. Um, these are, of course, uh, very sad scenes that we are seeing today. And uh, as you rightly say, they've been watched by millions and millions of Arabs and Muslims around the world. Yasser Arafat had a huge following in, in countries like Indonesia, like India indeed. I remember uh, interviewing Indira Gandhi right a few hours before she died and her talking to me about the legacy of Yasser Arafat and what Yasser Arafat meant to the Indian people. And I remember going back and, and meeting uh, President Arafat and telling him about that. And, and he was always so proud when he heard that people like Nelson Mandela or Indira Gandhi uh, spoke about him and, and, and indeed thought he was the right leader to lead his people. He, he had this obsession with, with, with his image being the right image. He, he had this obsession uh, of pleasing his people, of indeed trying uh, to, to reach his his goal and the people's goal, he he always felt very very strongly, as as I said before, about refugees in in Jordan. Uh, I, I think in Jordan more than anywhere else, as as well as in Lebanon and in Syria, he, he always spoke of their plight, uh, of them living in 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 very bad conditions. He often said that if they are living in their land and they they are living in in a bad state, at least this is their land. At least. Uh, they, they have reached the, the promised land while it is for others uh, who don't know indeed if they wanted uh, they will be allowed to come back or not that's why I think he firmly believed that uh, these people should be allowed to come back or at least should be permitted uh, to, to have some permanent st uh, uh, status in, in their country there, there were lots of negotiations uh, going and coming uh, about about this uh, Palestinian refugee problem and that's why it was very very difficult for somebody li uh, like Yasser Arafat I remember when people were speaking and saying it is Abu Mazen and Ahmed Qurayya that they were conducting the, the negotiations in Oslo we all knew that he was behind these negotiations, indeed, minute by minute, uh, receiving phone calls from them. And indeed, Abu Mazen and Ahmed Qurayh never were able to, to uh, move one step forward to, uh, uh, in those negotiations. He was very proud of these negotiations. He was very proud of signing the negotiations. Perhaps his proudest moment indeed was when he uh, has, was awarded the Nobel Prize uh, he, 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 I, I've never actually seen such a picture of him with such delight and uh, I, I knew people who were with him at the time who, who said that he said this is one of the proudest moments in my life. Of course probably the proudest would have been if he was being able to have Jerusalem as the capital of a Palestinian state. Uh, Yasser Arafat alas also died having not seen his daughter who we had seen today for the first time and he had not seen her in three years and I know uh, many times while I was conducting interviews with his wife Soha in, in Tunisia indeed in Cairo or in Paris uh, he would call and he would speak to her and ask her whether he, she had uh, uh, done her studies whether she had read that book or this book and I, I know that he was promising his family and himself that indeed he would he would be uh, having them come to visit in Ramallah or indeed come and live in Ramallah but he never referred to living in Ramallah he always wanted to live in Jerusalem for him his real house would be not in Gaza or Ramallah it would be Jerusalem and he was inviting people he, he, he was telling me would you please tell uh, the diva of the Arab world Fairuz the singer that we want her to come and sing for us in Jerusalem he always and often referred to Jerusalem as a focal point in everything he said and he talked and in his dreams and aspirations, Jerusalem was the number one item. It's, it's a very sad day today for all of us and it's a day that we will all remember with great sadness.
as we watch those pictures of perhaps some members of the crowd beginning slowly to make their way home, conscious perhaps that this is the end of a long day at the end of Ramadan. People will be anxious to get home and break the fast. A, a little uncertainty perhaps about exactly where we are in the ceremonial. It seems that Yasser Arafat has already somewhere in the middle of that seething crowd been buried. Uh, there was uncertainty about exactly what was going on because at one point the crowd seemed to be pulling the coffin in one direction while the authorities tried to exert some kind of control over what was going on. But it does seem now as though it has happened and for most of the Palestinians there who were in a state of great agitation earlier on, uh, it's, one gets the distinct sense now that they feel that this day is, is coming to an end. I think it's, it's uh, interesting to note what will happen later. I think what we will see is slowly the crowd will disperse because it is the last day of Ramadan where people have to end their fast in, in a little while. But I would imagine that this night will go on, uh, of mourning will go on in various parts of the Palestinian territories. It's a, a, a sad that we are not seeing pictures from various towns. I imagine as well that the Palestinian leadership will be receiving condolences for the rest of the week, not only today. And it's poignant that at the third day in the Muslim faith, there will be prayers as well, and people will come again to pay condolences, again also after a week. And the 40th day is the last day that people will also hear prayers and mourn, and then life will go on. Let's just trace back a little bit from uh, what we're seeing here in Ramallah to events earlier in the day. This morning, a military funeral was held for Yasser Arafat in the Egyptian capital, Cairo, several hundred miles away. It was attended by world leaders and politicians from more than 40 countries. And the brief ceremony led by President Mubarak of Egypt was followed by a procession through the city. Borrowed pageantry for a stateless president. Yasser Arafat's ambition was to be treated as a national leader, but the final military honors were those of Egypt. But while Egypt offered pomp, it kept away people. The route was closed to the public. The procession just a short walk back to the airport where his body had arrived last night. President Mubarak of Egypt and Crown Prince Abdullah of Saudi Arabia walked in the front rank, along with the Palestinian leaders who'd taken over Arafat's key leadership roles. More than 40 countries were represented, many leaders with whom he'd quarreled bitterly in his campaign to gain recognition for Palestine. They came as much for the cause as the person. Allahu Akbar. The day began with a brief funeral service led by the Sheikh of Al-Azhar, a widely respected authority among Sunni Muslims. He said Arafat had served his people all his life. <coughs> President Mugabe of Zimbabwe came, as did President Mbeki of South Africa, signifying support for someone who'd fought for his aims. Attendance was a careful diplomatic signal. Israel, calling Arafat a killer, stayed away. President Bashar Assad of Syria came. Europe, carefully formal, sent its foreign ministers. So this final journey was something of a tableau of support for the Palestinian cause. His wife, Suha, and his nine-year-old daughter, Zawa, were the only ones to show open grief. But without ordinary people, this was a dry, dull occasion. A duty to be dispatched swiftly before the leader who'd spent so long in exile could finally return home. Brian Hanrahan, BBC News, Cairo. Well, we're back to Ramallah now. Uh, these pictures coming in live to us. Uh, many thousand people still remain there, although we have, of course, heard now that Yasser Arafat's uh, burial has taken place. Uh, with us in the studio, Paul Adams. Paul, tell us uh, what will happen now. Well, I guess for a lot of these people, uh, this is pretty much over. I think there's a sense now that one or two people are beginning to make their way home. It was extraordinary to see the scenes as the helicopter that brought the coffin uh, from uh, Sinai Peninsula 
uh, arrived in Ramallah, there were absolutely chaotic scenes. And it seemed for a while as if the, the, the Palestinian population who had pressed in the streets, the, 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 the young shebab as they're called, the young activists, had pressed into the compound. It seemed for a while as if almost they were going to take over the events of the day. Uh, with many of them dreaming, no doubt, of, of trying to take Yasser Arafat's body from Ramallah down the road to Jerusalem, not so very far away, just a few miles, but it would have been an extraordinarily hazardous and potentially cataclysmic uh, journey because the Israelis had made it absolutely clear that they would not tolerate any attempt to uh, transfer Yasser Arafat's body from Ramallah to Jerusalem. For a while, there was just a bit of a, a tension in the air while it seemed as though uh, the, the, the Palestinian uh, population might try and exert their own authority over this. But in perhaps typically chaotic uh, Palestinian way, it has all now passed off. We have seen the new Palestinian leadership uh, gathered around the coffin. We have seen prayers going on. And somewhere in the press of the crowd, Yasser Arafat's body will have been taken out of that wooden coffin and put in the ground in a white shroud. How long he stays there in his comp compound in Ramallah, of course, is anyone's guess. Most Palestinians, perhaps all Palestinians, dream of a time when they might move him to what they regard as his rightful resting place in Jerusalem. Not something that the Israeli government will countenance at all. But for now, as the sun begins to dip quite far now, and uh, we, we can't be so very far from sunset, maybe another hour or so, I think we will see more and more of these people uh, heading home. Of course, Ramallah is not uh, an exclusively Muslim town. In fact, uh, traditionally it has been a Christian town. The balance has changed over the years as many Christians have left and, and, and sought uh, their lives elsewhere. But there are large numbers of Christians still living uh, in Ramallah. And for them, the same constraints of Ramadan, Ramadan do not apply. So many of them may choose to stay uh, and linger a while as the sun goes down and, and perhaps to choose uh, to, to use that last opportunity to pay their respects. Well, the events of the last couple of hours have been in stark contrast to uh, what we saw in Paris yesterday and then in Cairo earlier today. Let's just look back now on what's been happening over this last few hours. Paul Seagert reports. Back home, Yasser Arafat's body returns to the West Bank and waiting his people, the people he led for more than 30 years. Thousands of ordinary Palestinians wanting to pay their last respects. The final confirmation of his death on Thursday has unleashed an emotional outpouring of grief culminating in today's burial. Such were the numbers who came to honour Mr Arafat, it took more than 20 minutes to remove the coffin from the helicopter. Then, chaotic scenes as the crowds converged. 48 hours ago, this was a wasteland of rubble and twisted metal. People and bulldozers worked throughout the night to prepare the grave. All day, Israeli forces have been on a maximum state of alert in case of trouble closing off many towns and cities in the West Bank. Most Palestinians are banned from travelling from the Gaza Strip. Instead, Gaza City held its own symbolic funeral service at the same time as the West Bank burial was taking place. Arafat's death marks the passing of an era in the Middle East, and although the future is unclear, today is about paying respects to the man who has led the Palestinian cause for more than 30 years. To the backdrop of prayers and gunfire, the Palestinian leader was buried in the grounds of the same Ramallah compound in which he was confined by Israeli forces for more than two and a half years. Paul Seagat, BBC News. And this is the scene now in Ramallah, uh, with Yasser Arafat's body having been flown into the compound by helicopter around about just over an hour and a half ago today and still the gunfire ringing out in the compound which she was holed up in for more than two years. Uh, but for much of the time it wasn't uh, the berries of the soldiers that we could see, uh, but the faces of ordinary people who have turned out to pay respects 
to their leader today and the shots that were ringing out uh, were shots fired by soldiers uh, for some time for 25 minutes as the helicopters hovered above those crowds uh, the soldiers tried to get people to pull back but uh, such was the emotion of the moment that everybody who was drawn here today, tens of thousands of people, wanted to pay their respects. Let's bring in now uh, Dr. Maha Assam, who's a Middle East analyst at the Royal Institute of International Affairs. She joins us uh, here in the studio as we look at these images out of Ramallah. Of course, for many years, the Israelis have tried to marginalize Yasser Arafat, uh, George Bush too, latterly. What will people make of these scenes today? I think clearly Arafat remains a very strong symbol. Uh, clearly he had great popularity among the Palestinian people. There are mixed uh, feelings as to his achievements. Certainly the Palestinian people themselves are divided. Some feel that he has lost opportunities for them. Others feel that he stood steadfast. And that is the general feeling also throughout the Arab world. So at the moment I think what we're seeing is a sense of grief, a sense of anger as well, which may, after the funeral, translate itself into more anger and frustration on the streets of the occupied territories. But we have to wait and see. Yeah, do you, I mean, do you th what is the best indication here, or the best calculation, that this is one day, one occasion for the streets to take over, or is this a sign of what is to come in the battle for the leadership, that actually perhaps the old guard, which appeared to be being set up at the moment with Mahmoud Abbas and Abu Kraya, uh, Abu Kraya in fact will not win the day but the militants will. Certainly there's a lot of tension there and we can even see the, that kind of tension uh, resonate today in terms of the different factions that have come out and I think yes it's going to be a bit of a battle. There is going to be a power struggle within the Palestinian leadership structure and it's going to be very difficult for the old guard to hold on because they neither have the stature of Yasser Arafat nor his charisma and there's also going to be, be a feeling that maybe the Palestinians ought to move on. They stood by Yasser Arafat but Yasser Arafat was different in their eyes. There's no need for them to stick with the rest of the old guard. So you're saying that Mahmoud Abbas and uh, Ahmed Korea may not be able to carry the youth, all those disenfranchised young people with them. What is it that they will be looking for then? I think what they need to do is to create a degree of consensus and there are various parties that want to be represented now within the leadership structure. There is Hamas, there are others who feel that they also represent the Palestinian people and have clearly not had sufficient say in terms of the way things should go and that's why they've also had to express themselves on the street and a lot of tension is going to come from the whole issue of integrating the militants within the new structure. How do you think Israel will be watching this at the moment? I mean, is it, is it what they expect? Will they read into this a sign for the future? The Israelis were obviously very inimical to this man. They look at this and they say this is symbolic of the chaos and support that the Palestinians have for this man. And I think it will be seen fairly cynically. Uh, they, there will be those Israelis who will look to the new leadership and hope that it is more pragmatic and it might be able to deliver. But I think the Israelis on the whole now are still very cynical. Let's uh, bring in Alan Johnson, who's our correspondent in Gaza, and uh, he joins us now on the, uh, on the line. Alan, we've seen all the many thousands of ordinary people turn out in Ramallah, but of course many of those in the occupied territories were barred from coming here. Uh, how have they watched and witnessed uh, Arafat's funeral and his burial today? Well, people here have been absolutely riveted to televisions or radio sets following the extraordinary uh, events, really h historic in every way that we were watching in, uh, in Ramallah in terms of the end of this uh, Palestinian era, the end uh, of Mr. Arafat's time. But I'm actually speaking to you from uh, the site that's going to be the main focus of the morning for Mr. Arafat here in Gaza. I'm in the presidential compound, the place that he worked from and lived in for several years in the immediate aftermath. Uh, of the Oslo agreements. A large tent has been set up in front of me and people are beginning to arrive now. Some, some, some thousands of people certainly 
beginning to uh, come through the gates here. I can see many fighters, uh, men in masks with guns, and you may be able to hear some of the shooting going off I I in the background, but it is an orderly scene, definitely. This is a, a celebratory or tributary kind of fire in the air. I see the green flags of the Hamas movement, I see the flags of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, and I see the flags of the Al-Aqsa Brigade. That's the uh, armed militia faction loosely linked to Yasser Arafat's Fatah organization. Uh, coming together then uh, of these groups uh, to remember Yasser Arafat on this day here in Gaza. So, Alan, this is not then uh, a day for anger because uh, many people have expressed some feelings of anger at the way Yasser Arafat was treated, uh, effectively a prisoner for over two and a half years in his compound in Ramallah. Well, indeed, uh, I think that, that anger, of course, anger... Uh, yes, Arafat in so many ways symbolized what the uh, Palestinian uh, people felt that they were enduring and that uh, incarceration uh, of their leader as they saw it wa was uh, something that a lot of people feel quite often here I in the occupied territories when there are what uh, the Israelis call closures, limitations on movement uh, between one town or the next. Uh, it it's possible quite often, for example, for the Israelis to cut the Gaza Strip in two or three. So people could all relate to the kind of uh, pressures that sometimes Mr. Arafat felt. Remember that Mr. Arafat f always refused the terms on which he was uh, allowed to come or go from the, from the Makata building, the, the conditions that Israel set down. Alan Johnson from Gaza with that reaction. Thank you. You are watching BBC News. Now with us in the studio here in London is our World Affairs correspondent Mike Wardridge. Mike, it's astonishing, isn't it? Only half an hour ago, there were thousands of people, many of them with the AK-47s, sending off volleys of gunshot into the air, loud chants as they surged towards this coffin. The scene there, as we see it, is one of a certain amount of constraint. It is extraordinary, isn't it? The range of scenes, the range of uh, emotions that we've had during the course of the day from that uh, very military atmosphere surrounding the funeral ceremony in Cairo this morning uh, and the brevity of that through to, as you say, the height of the emotions as the, coffin, as the helicopter bearing Yasser Arafat's coffin arrived in the compound in Ramallah. And, and so many things then that just symbolize the nature of this day. The fact that um, the members of the Palestinian leadership who, who are succeeding Mr. Arafat, at least in the short term, the fact they simply couldn't get out of their helicopter. They had to beg the crowds to let them out. The same with the coffin itself people, uh, Palestinians, individual Palestinians wanting to take over the whole occasion and then the tussle for control that really happened over the course of the next hour or so between the uh, clearly overwhelmed Palestinian security forces and the people, the curtailing of all the planned events, the fact that there was to be this lying in state of his coffin for, for anything up to a couple of hours, all that had to be abandoned in the great surge of, of uh, popular emotion that we saw surrounding the coffin until he was he was finally buried uh, indeed the contrast between what we were looking at there in Ramallah in the compound of Yasser Arafat uh, compared with earlier in the day in Cairo is difficult to imagine a larger contrast isn't it it is I, I think that really what the, the highest moments of emotion would surely have been where where people were essentially paying their respects to mourning what Yasser Arafat symbolized at that moment. That, that was the most important thing. And I imagine that for, for many Palestinians, they would say that uh, what uh, he did um, identify with is in fact something that lives on. They would say that they come along to pay respect, for, pay respect to uh, his aspirations for there to be a Palestinian state, the stand he'd taken against Israel. Uh, that they most certainly would not see having died with Yasser Arafat today. So although they've come to see his, his burial uh, for them so frustratingly close to the Jerusalem that he would wish to have been uh, buried in, I imagine that they were coming along there wanting to be seen at, in that compound in particular, to be as close as possible to his body at that time. Uh, so that they could themselves become part of what he symbolized, what he embodied. 
Indeed, it very much felt as though this was not only an end of an era for the Palestinians, but indeed for the world. Somebody has already pointed out that uh, Yasser Arafat represented the last of a long line of nationalist leaders who came to the fore in the, in the 1940s and 50s. Yes, that, that's certainly true, but of course a nationalist leader who was never actually to lead a state. We have to remember that, and I think that uh, uh, that fact that his own ambitions were, were not to be fulfilled and his people's ambitions were not to be fulfilled. All that made the emotional charge um, so much greater today. I mean, exactly how much this does turn out to be a watershed in the politics of the whole region, of course, very much remains to be seen. In a sense, it could be that it's business as normal from tomorrow, that that emotion has been very much contained within the one day, the day of his burial. That depends on so much what the new leadership does, what new leadership emerges. Uh, how the international community now uh, deals with the region, whether it becomes more engaged with the region, whether it sees Arafat's death in a way as a turning point, and of course also how Israel responds to all of this. Mike, thanks very much indeed for that. We can go live to Ramallah now and uh, pick up with our correspondent Barbara Plett, who spent the day there. Uh, Barbara, does it look to you as though people are returning to their homes? Yes, because the event is over now. Just in the last minute or so, the helicopters from Egypt lifted off, carrying the Egyptian dignitaries back to Cairo. Um, Yasser Arafat has been laid to rest in his grave here in the Ramallah compound, and people are now beginning to disperse. You know, even clashes has now gone away. I'm sorry, can you please repeat that? Uh, do you feel as though the potential for any kind of tension has gone away? You know, I don't know if there was that much potential for tension. I didn't get a sense that there was anything particularly uh, angry or dangerous about this crowd. Just everybody wanted to be here. They wanted to see him, and they wanted to be where he was buried. They, in a sense, the state funeral took place in Cairo, and this was here in Ramallah, the people reclaiming their leader. This was the people's funeral. So there was a lot of emotion, uh, but I wouldn't say it was a da any, there was any danger of violence as such. We, there, we heard a lot of gunfire, I'm sure. That was the security forces trying to get the people to step back. I wouldn't even say it was so much grief, just a very much a, a strong sense of emotion that the Palestinian leader had come back for the last time here to Palestine. He had not achieved his, uh, his dreams, as, as Mike was saying. There, was, there is no state to leave behind. He's not even able to be buried in Jerusalem, as he would have wished. Uh, but people here wanted to uh, see him come back and then see him buried and show their respects. Is that a, a surprise to you, Barbara, the fairly uh, restrained nature of the grieving then for Yasser Arafat? No, I think, I mean, the grieving has taken place over the past couple of weeks while people have watched him slowly dying. So I think they were, were prepared for that. And we did see quite a lot of people crying yesterday. I think this was much more a sort of a public event uh, where people came together to participate in the burial of their leader. And uh, it, there was a lot of action, of course, the helicopters coming, people surging forward, people trying to get close to the coffin, the, the security men firing wildly in the air to clear a corridor. It, there was almost a, a sort of... A, uh, maybe festive is not the right word, but a sort of public spirit about it. Um, but uh, I think the grieving has happened, and this was also part of the emotion. Barbara, thanks very much indeed. Barbara Plett there has been in Ramallah for the day. Well, in Jerusalem, our correspondent is Richard Myron. Richard, how has this uh, event played uh, with most Israelis today? Well, many Israelis have been listening and watching uh, the, the events of the past few hours. I think that really they, they do see the importance of this for them. Uh, time and again in the press, we've heard uh, Israeli politicians quoted over the last few days as saying that this represents an opportunity for them. Um, Israel stands at a crossroads. And I think very much all Israelis are looking at these pictures knowing that. They know that really they can go in one of two directions um, with a Palestinian leadership they feel they can do business with, um, or alternatively one they can't or, or uh, indeed Gaza and West Bank which could descend into chaos and which could obviously have enormous impact upon their lives. So I think there is a sense of very cautious optimism here which is also tinged by an element of anxiety. Indeed, uh, the Israeli forces actually tightened the security cordon around the Palestinian territories uh, in, in preparation for possible uh, uh, tension, any kind of incidents? 
there have been a few incidents. I have to stress, I was down in the old city of Jerusalem, the site of all the holy sites, the Muslim, Jewish and Christian holy sites, and the place was literally in every alleyway. There, there were many, many police, army, border police and so on. The Israelis did not want anything to happen. They kept out people uh, who, uh, uh, they would not allow people who were under the age of 45 to enter the Haram al-Sharif or the Temple Mount, this holy area, uh, for prayers on Friday, which limited the potential for trouble. Nonetheless, there have been some minor incidents um, in Arab areas of Jerusalem. I think the main major fear for the Israelis has been that if trouble started it could reel out of control and it could indeed uh, reignite popular discontent which we saw uh, in the course of the past few years. In terms of moving forward on the broader level of uh, negotiations with any new Palestinian leadership, do you think that uh, the government of Ariel Sharon is in the right disposition to make the first move as it were? Well, I think there's, uh, there's an element of, uh, of caution, I think, for the Israeli government, if indeed it wants to do that. It can't seem to be, to be cozying up, as it were, to the new Palestinian leadership, because that will only undermine that leadership in the eyes of the Palestinian street. At the same time, people here, Israeli commentators, some on the Israeli left, are suggesting that Maybe the government here should do a number of gestures to ease the passage of this government, to send a message to the Palestinian people that it can do business with this leadership, such as, for example, easing many of the military checkpoints that are throughout the West, West Bank and Gaza, maybe admitting more Palestinians into Israel to work, maybe even some have suggested, uh, uh, have suggested releasing some Palestinian prisoners held in Israeli jails. But all that really, I think, remains to be seen. Nobody quite knows how Ariel Sharon now is going to act now that he doesn't have his political nemesis uh, Yes, Arafat as it were sitting opposite him Okay Richard thanks very much indeed for updating us on the situation from Jerusalem here in the studio in London is Mike Wardridge our world affairs correspondent Mike nothing really has changed at this point for the Palestinians despite this day of momentous occasion I'm sure that's exactly what uh, they would say of course in a sense uh, uh, something has most certainly changed with Yasser Arafat's death and one of the things that's changed in terms of the uh, possibility now of the of the peace process uh, so stagnant picking up again is that it was of course Yasser Arafat who the Israelis in particular described as the obstacle to peace now uh, with his death obviously in a way the ball uh, is thrown back into their court uh, and as Richard Myron was just saying what attitude will they strike to the new leadership uh, we've already I think had the Israelis in a way preempting that challenge to them by saying uh, as uh, Ariel Sharon himself was yesterday um, we will determine what we do by whether um, there is a curbing of militancy of terrorism as they would describe it uh, in the, the region so they're throwing the responsibility back to the back to the Palestinians. So um, this, I think, politically is clearly the kind of uh, tussle that we are going to see now. Once the, um, the headiness of all the emotions that have been surrounding Yasser Arafat's burial today uh, have gone away. Mike, thanks very much indeed for that. So just to recap then, Yasser Arafat has been buried in fairly chaotic scenes that have taken place in Ramallah in his compound there. There was firing into the air. Palestinian security men struggled to remove his body from the helicopter that had arrived from the official military funeral that he had been given in the Egyptian capital, Cairo. Scenes of overwhelming grief and chaos at Yasser Arafat's funeral. The Palestinian leader completes the journey to his final resting place in the West Bank. Earlier, Cairo hosted his funeral ceremony, attended by his widow and foreign dignitaries. Hello and welcome to BBC World News, I'm Martine Dennis. The Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat has been buried at his final resting place at the Mukata compound in Ramallah in the West Bank. His coffin had arrived by helicopter to a tumultuous welcome by crowds of tens of thousands of Palestinians who'd flooded into the compound. Mourners were chanting and waving their fists in the air, climbing walls and electricity poles to catch a final glimpse of their leader. Mr. Arafat has been buried with soil taken from the Al-Aqsa Mosque and Jerusalem's Temple Mount. 
where he'd wanted to be laid to rest. Michael Voss has been watching the day's extraordinary events. Yasser Arafat's funeral began with a simple, short prayer service at a military mosque in Cairo. His wooden coffin draped in a Palestinian flag. Egypt's president, Hosni Mubarak, joined senior Palestinian figures in greeting representatives from more than 40 countries who'd come to pay their last respects. Amongst them, many Arab heads of state, including Syria's president, Assad. Most of Europe, though, was represented at foreign minister level, including Britain's Jack Straw, while America sent an assistant secretary of state. Then the pomp and ceremony of a military procession with Yasser Arafat's coffin carried aboard a horse-drawn gun carriage. This was a state funeral for a leader without a state. Admire or revile him, the world could not ignore Yasser Arafat nor forget the Palestinian cause. Security was tight, the Egyptian public were not allowed on the streets as the procession made the short journey to a military airport. Tears from his nine-year-old daughter Zawa, who along with his wife Suha watched as the casket was taken aboard an Egyptian Air Force plane en route to Ramallah. After the orderly scenes in Cairo, the Palestinian authorities found it hard to cope as thousands tried to enter the Ramallah compound to pay their last respects. This is where Yasser Arafat had been confined by the Israelis in recent years. Now it's where his body will be laid to rest. A cry of God is great arose as the helicopter, bringing their leader home, hovered above the compound. Then came the sound of gunfire as security forces and the armed militias paid tribute to the former guerrilla fighter who also won a Nobel Peace Prize. As the crowd surged forward, it took time to open the helicopter doors. Yasser Arafat had wanted to be buried in Jerusalem, but that will not happen unless a political solution to the conflict can be found. Now, with the passing of the Arafat era, there are renewed hopes that the peace process might get back on track. Michael Voss, BBC News. OK, that was a scene in Ramallah just a couple of minutes ago. We can go live there now and join our correspondent, Lise Doucette. Lise. Yes, and uh, welcome back to Ramallah. We're speaking to you against the din of firecrackers and volleys of Kalashnikov fire. It's the, the sun begins to set here on the most extraordinary of days. And you can see behind me that the crowds that thronged into that compound uh, earlier today have now begun to disperse. The security forces have been asking Palestinians to leave so that they can clear the area. But we see by the graveside where Yasser Arafat was buried a short time ago, some Palestinians are refusing to leave. They want to, to continue to stay and to say, pay their last respects uh, to the man they call Abu Amar. You can hear also the wail of the ambulances here. We understand a number of people have been wounded by the gunfire, which have resonated here throughout the day, throughout these rather extraordinary funeral proceedings for the Palestinian leader. A funeral as extraordinary as the man himself. And it's a funeral not just for the leader of the Palestinians, that Yasser Arafat is the last of the nationalist Arab leaders who forged politics in this region for the last half century, ever since the founding of the Jewish state. It was an extraordinary day here, watched uh, here in Ramallah by the thousands of people who thronged the compound and in a frenzy seemed at one point to make it impossible for Yasser Arafat to be buried here today. And of course, an event that's being watched uh, by millions of people around the world, including Israelis who have not hidden their belief that the man they call the face of terrorism, an obstacle to peace, uh, 
has now passed away. Israeli Prime Minister Aaron Sharon has spoken of a new chapter in the beginning of a new era in the Middle East. Uh, you can see now the crowds have begun to thin in the compound of uh, the Makata. In the last half hour, the two helicopters uh, which came from Egypt bearing uh, the casket of Yasser Arafat draped with the Palestinian flag and also his closest aides and officials, the men who will take over now from the Yasser Arafat, getting three most important bodies that he made. Some of them are going to be in the It's been a most extraordinary day indeed, and then most of all for the Palestinians who've been watching the day's proceedings. Riyad Malki, a Palestinian analyst, has been with us. Um, Riyad, the sun is setting now. It'll be the end of a day of fasting also for Palestinian Muslims. And we can see that some people are still refusing to leave. They, they want to be at the graveside. And we've heard there will be a vigil tonight. Yes, this is what they have promised, that they want uh, to have a vigil. At the same time, they want really to uh, create a new culture uh, regarding the, the tomb of uh, Arafat, that uh, uh, the culture states that uh, the, uh, the tomb should be really guarded by his own sons and the sons of Fatah and the sons of the Palestinian people. So we will see tonight the vigil, but we'll start to see starting to, from tomorrow people coming from the different uh, ways of life in Palestine in order to spend hours and days with his tomb in order to show his uh, their respect to him and uh, to thank him for what he has done to the Palestinian people and to the Palestinian cause. It was very much a people's funeral, very chaotic. Uh, there must be some relief among security forces and officials here and relief in Israel that the most militant of the Palestinians to carry out their pledge to put Yasser Arafat on their shoulders and carry him to Jerusalem. Well, uh, thanks God that didn't really happen because uh, nobody could have really uh, expected uh, the reaction of the Israeli side in this case. And we wanted also to show, uh, at one hand, uh, respect for, uh, for uh, uh, the, our uh, late president and at the same time to send a message to the rest of the world that uh, while we loved him, we respected him and there was a little bit of chaos in the funeral, but still, you know, we would like to really obey by the uh, law and order that should really prevent Palestinian territory. This is for us is very important uh, aspect regarding, you know, the, uh, the new era that should really start uh, from today. It was a historic day, but it was undeniably a very chaotic day. The Palestinian officials had hoped uh, they would allow the Palestinian leader to lie in state for Palestinian officials to pile past uh, the coffin, uh, pay their last respects in a more solemn and dignified fashion. And the Palestinians, the thousands who gathered here, made it absolutely clear they wanted none of that. They didn't want uh, this to be an official ceremony. They wanted it to be a day for the Palestinians uh, to say goodbye in the way they wished. Uh, but will this be a day the Palestinians are proud of? Well, I think they, they are proud of uh, this day because, you know, they understood from the beginning that they were excluded from the celebrations and from the funeral, that the funeral was exclusive to officials. And uh, then people were very much uh, angry with that, and that's why we've seen that uh, even with the force that was really uh, introduced at the beginning, they could have really prevented the people from getting into, you know, the, the, the compound and really to be so close to the to the body of uh, the late uh, President Arafat. So here, you know, it seems that people really won, and really people showed uh, their leaders a very important message that you know sh you should not take us for granted. We could really influence things and really influence uh, outcome. It's very important that the whole program really collapsed. Nothing really worked, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, but it uh, it went very well. You know uh, that he was buried. People were pleased that they were uh, the, that they saw him, and they, then you know they left. Uh, it was a mixture. The whole day was a mixture of many things. It was uh, a, a relief. It was a celebration. It was a funeral. 
it was uh, uh, a day off. It was uh, uh, people for people just to come in to sh to see things. It was a mixture of things, and that I, I believe that everybody was uh, was happy with it. Uh, they got something that they, they wanted to, uh, from it, and uh, they were leaving so uh, happy. We've seen them, you know, leaving, you know, out of the compound uh, in, in in orderly fashion, and I believe that uh, this really reflects that exactly. I want to repeat again that the new era of the Palestinian history has been really started today and it, it, it really gives us very good hope. Riyad Malki, thank you very much uh, for you. joining us here in Ramallah and a reflection on the extraordinary funeral that we saw here today, the last goodbye to the 75-year-old Palestinian leader. And all of today's ceremonies, whether it was the short and somber, dignified military funeral that we saw starting the day in the Egyptian capital, Cairo, or the more emotional outpouring of grief and emotion here in Ramallah, they were a tribute to Yasser Arafat, but they were also a tribute to the cause that he represented. As Riyad Malki said, it is the Palestinian people who now have to carry on. And across the world, there are people are saying this is the start, of perhaps, of a new attempt to try to forge a lasting peace between Israel and the Palestinians. We'll continue to bring you live coverage of the events uh, here in Ramallah and across the Middle East. But for now, for Middies to set its goodbye and back to you in London. Okay, so that was the scene in Ramallah with Lise Doucette. Let's go to Gaza now and our correspondent there, Alan Johnston. Alan, I don't know if you were hearing about this combination of emotions that uh, I'm, I'm told now we can't, we can't go to Gaza because uh, our lines have just gone down, but we'll hope to go to Gaza to find out exactly what the situation was like there today because, of course, Gazans weren't able to travel to Ramallah. But now we can go to Washington. We've got a correspondent there, Daniela Ralph. Daniela, um, this moment is being described as an opportunity to revitalize the, the, the stagnant peace process in the Middle East. Is that something that George Bush agrees with? It is, I think, yes. And the White House are being extremely cautious about how they react to the death of Yasser Arafat. But I do think that they definitely believe this is a, an opportunity to re-engage in the Middle East peace process, to give it some momentum, to reinvigorate it. It has stagnated for some time. Uh, Yasser Arafat was somebody the White House just felt they couldn't do business with and couldn't negotiate with on any level. So uh, his death for the White House will clearly mean that it, it opens up some form of negotiation. But the Americans are very cautious about how they deal with this now. Um, they do not want to be seen to uh, be anointing any new figure in the Palestinian leadership. They want to hold back, see how the new leadership uh, settles in and organizes itself. Um, they do not want to anoint any individual for fear of that person uh, being seen as some kind of American stooge and therefore losing credibility. So some optimism, I think, but caution there as well. Is there a sense that there's any ground left in the roadmap for peace, or will this require a complete different approach to a to a final settlement well the British Prime Minister Tony Blair is here today for talks with uh, President Bush uh, and he will be saying to the president that he hopes there is some life still left in the roadmap and that they can perhaps work together to reinvigorate that and work with that as some kind of basis for a Middle East peace settlement. Uh, but Tony Blair will also want to again say to George Bush that he really feels that this is an opportunity, this is a chance for a new chapter in the Middle East peace process to start and he will want to uh, perhaps uh, get something back for the loyalty that he has shown to the president over Iraq and get some kind of commitment from the White House on the peace process in the Middle East. So uh, I think uh, they don't want to rule anything out or rule anything in. There is still some hope that uh, the roadmap can be revitalized in some way and Tony Blair will want to put pressure on that front. Um, do you get a sense of how proactive the White House is prepared to be or will that depend upon who actually leads the State Department if indeed that's not going to be Colin Powell? I think it will depend on who leads the State Department, of course, and also uh, how the new Palestinian leadership uh, figures out and how that organizes itself as well. So uh, expect no uh, firm commitments from the White House on anything to do with the Middle East peace process at this stage, other than perhaps to say uh, this is an opportunity and a chance to perhaps uh, work on, on some kind of settlement again. They will want to see what individuals are in place, who they feel they can work with on, on a face-to-face -face level in, in terms of the Palestinian leadership. And uh, they they will clearly just want to see what the personalities are there and how things work out over the next few weeks. Daniela, thanks very much indeed for that. Well, 
We tried a little bit earlier, we failed, but now we're going to try again. I'm told that Alan Johnston is on the line from Gaza. Um, we've seen extraordinary scenes in Ramallah. How was it in Gaza, Alan? Well, of course, Palestinians here in Gaza have been riveted by the events of that extraordinary afternoon in Ramallah. And at the same time as they were unfolding, there was a, a symbolic, as they called it, symbolic funeral march through the center of Gaza City and that's just coming to an end right here and as I talk to you I can see a, a military band and uh, two streams of soldiers carrying uh, a coffin, a, a, co a symbolic coffin of Yasser Arafat slowly into the compound that he lived in for several years uh, next to the sea here in Gaza City. This is very much the end of the march now and it has a distinctly militaristic feel with a, a number of militiamen from Hamas. I see the banners of Hamas here, the banners of the Al-Aqsa Brigade attached to Fatah and also the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, many of them loosing off their weapons in the air in tribute to Yasser Arafat. And did you detect a sense of frustration being that uh, they weren't actually allowed to travel to Ramallah even if Gazans had wanted to? Of course, I'm sure many of the people that I'm looking down on now would have very, very much liked to have been able to make that journey to Ramallah, but I don't think anybody here seriously contemplated the idea of Israel stepping back and uh, uh, releasing a large number of people from Gaza to make the journey across Israel to the West Bank. Uh, Israel would certainly say that uh, Gaza's the home of organizations like Hamas which spend a lot of time trying to get suicide bombers into Israel and they would have said certainly that for security reasons they wouldn't have allowed a lot of ordinary Gazan people to make that journey. And you say that uh, Gaza had a much more militaristic feel. Uh, is that because of the very, very uh, large presence of groups like Hamas in, in the area? Just to, to make that, that point clear, I'm saying that the end of the march here uh, has definitely a more militaristic feel. The majority of people, I would say, here are from uh, different uh, elements of the, 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 the different uh, military factions. But I'm told that uh, as the march was coming through town, there were many more civilian members of uh, supporters of Arafat there. OK, Alan, thanks very much indeed for giving us uh, the situation in Gaza today. Well, in the studio with me now is our world affairs correspondent Mike Wardridge. Mike, the day's gone well, hasn't it? Yes, I mean, I imagine in many ways uh, th that's exactly what we could say. There were those scenes that looked chaotic, certainly to those of us watching from here in the compound for, for a time, but it was for a pretty limited period. And I'm, it was, in a sense, exactly the moment at which we might have expected the highest motions, emotions to be on display as uh, yes, uh, Arafat's coffin arrived and, and in the period before it was to be buried. Uh, so I think that in, in a sense you're right, I think uh, most of the parties involved in this will look back and say that it, it has gone well and been um, well managed. I mean, obviously there were some things there about the ability of the Palestinian security forces to control matters at that moment. Yes, it did all come under control in the end, but some might say it was rather ominous that they were having difficulty in keeping the event being taken entirely out of their control for a time. Others, the fact that it did regain more composure later on, that um, that augurs well for the future. Because it's just that sort of thing, I think, the, um, the, the policing aspects of the, of the occupied territories, um, the management, for example, of the process of elections that will now unfold in, in the Palestinian territories. Um, these will be important path, um, matters for for many as, as they look towards the future. It's interesting what we've just been hearing talking about in the last few minutes of the, of the potential course of events now. Uh, will there be a return to the roadmap and so on? Of course those, those indeed are, are very moot points but we must remember that there, there is indeed something that is on the table and it is the Israeli withdrawal from Gaza in the first months of next year if they are to keep to the timetable they have themselves um, laid down. Now uh, there certainly are countries that have been part of the, to the whole peace process that have said, yeah, if we can get the roadmap going again, so much the better. But let's look at what is feasible in the coming months. And, and it is that um, holding it, Israel to that um, commitment to withdraw and indeed to make sure that 
um, what happens on the ground in Gaza is actually improvement if that process of, of Israeli withdrawal takes place. These things are still very much true, even with Yasser Arafat's as you, as you mentioned, um, elections are due within 60 days. How critical is it to the whole process that these elections are held in free and fair conditions and that they uh, basically emit a, a credible uh, message of the Palestinian will? Well, I think we've been hearing, haven't we, from, uh, from many Palestinians who've been interviewed over the past uh, 24 hours uh, in response to Yasser Arafat's death, that they do indeed feel that that process of elections is, is going to be extremely important. There, there were, of course, those who criticised the, um, the leadership of the Palestinian Authority for cronyism and, and corruption and so on, and they do want this process of reform, and now through uh, elections to take place and obviously to take place in the right kind of environment so it can be judged to be free and fair. I think that will be critical and again the part that Israel plays in that is also important too. Thank you very much indeed Mike. Well we can go live now to our correspondent in Jerusalem Richard Myron and put that point to him. Um, Richard do you get a sense that uh, Israel is prepared to make any kind of changes to the conditions under which the Palestinians live in order to facilitate the electoral process? Well, I, I think this represents a real challenge to Ariel Sharon if they are to have these kind of elections, which we've been hearing about. I mean, one of the elements, the important elements that's got to happen there is that obviously Palestinians can, there is a, an element of freedom of movement more than exists at the moment. And also, for example, can Palestinians in East Jerusalem vote? There was a previous election, of course, in October 2000, in which Yasser Arafat was elected officially as president of the Palestinian Authority, and then a former formula was arrived at so that East Jerusalem Palestinians were able to vote because of course Israel says that this is part of Israel's undivided capital and initially it wasn't going to allow this. But I think this is going to be one of the first tests for Ariel Sharon as to how he deals with this new Palestinian leadership. Will he allow the elections to, to be carried out sort of reasonably freely and fairly? Will he loosen the grip of the occupation so that, that can happen? There are also fears that whatever the uh, that if these elections do occur that for example Palestinian militants, the Palestinian militants of, of Hamas and Islamic Jihad could make great gains and, and that would represent a huge challenge to the Israelis. Now Mike mentioned just a little bit uh, earlier the uh, Gaza pullout that's been proposed by Ariel Sharon. It's uh, scheduled to start at the early part of next year. Um, is, mm. is this event likely to alter any of Ariel Sharon's plans with regard to unilateral withdrawal from Gaza? Well, I think that Ariel Sharon might be hoping that he can really not do this now unilaterally, that he can do this possibly in negotiation with the Palestinians. It's going to test really how serious he is about this, how serious now he is about sitting down with the Palestinians and coming to a deal. He said that he had nobody to do a deal with because he couldn't deal with Yasser Arafat. Well, Yasser Arafat's no longer on the political stage, so what will he do? Some within his own government, most notably uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the former Prime Prime Minister have said that, that the Israeli government should rethink its, its disengagement plans for Gaza. It should wait and see what happens uh, within the Palestinian leadership. And very much I think there, this does represent uh, a challenge to the Israelis. Are they now going to go ahead or are they going to hold back with this plan? And I think that Benjamin Netanyahu will be lobbying quite heavily within the government um, so that this plan is delayed. Um, many, of course, on the Israeli left will be hoping that, that it proceeds more speedily than, as I said, involves a more comprehensive deal, which may involve, for example, negotiations about the West Bank. Okay, Richard, thanks very much indeed for that. Welcome to BBC News and our special coverage of the day. Palestinians and the world said goodbye to Yasser Arafat. I'm Lise Doucette in Ramallah, where the sun is setting on what has been an extraordinary day. A day of solemn ceremony and a frenzied farewell. Thousands of Palestinians flooded the compound as Yasser Arafat's body was brought back to Ramallah for burial. The day began with a short and solemn military funeral in Cairo to allow dignitaries from around the world to pay their last respects. This new era in the Middle East will be on the agenda when Tony Blair meets George W. Bush in talks in Washington.
Welcome to Ramallah at the end of what has been a momentous day, an emotional and historic day, not just for Palestinians, but for the entire Middle East. A few hours ago, before the sunset, the Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat was buried here in the compound just behind me in the Makata. Thousands of Palestinians had thronged into the compound, and for a moment it seemed as though they would disrupt the ceremonies. It was, as Palestinian leaders say, the way Yasser Arafat would have wanted it. A day which began with a solemn and somber ceremony in Cairo ended with a people's ceremony here in Ramallah. Andrew Burroughs now reports.